This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are starting a new week. Uh, we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. I am Prashant Nair. With me, as always, my colleague Sonia and Surbi is with us today as well. Good morning, guys. Hi, good, good morning. morning. All-time high is likely this week. Uh, today, I don't know, I mean, you know, the market cues no, are we, we such... No, uh, we were actually holding out for the two of you on Friday. We were almost there, 50 points, and we said, you know, Nigel, uh -huh. Mangalam and I, I don't know, well, let's wait. Let's wait uh, for Prashant and Sonia to get back. And then maybe we'll go ahead and scale that peak. I just, it, it, nice of you guys. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good time. It's a good time to be, you know, in the studio, right? When you hit all-time highs. So thanks for that. <laughs> well, uh, green is the color, right, Sonia? Yeah. It looks goodness. like it. I mean, let's just uh, take you through what you need to know in terms of uh, cues, right? So uh, we'll just start with that uh, basic kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, tidbit, which is that we're just about 60, 61 points away from all-time highs. The all-time high is 18,887. 0.60. I'm mentioning that decimal place because, I mean, on the bank nifty, you got to within 10 pesa and didn't quite make it, but eventually you did. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> just 61 points away. On Friday, I mean, if you're looking for global support, that wasn't there. The Nasdaq ended about three quarters of a percent lower. You had the U.S. 10-year yield, which was up about five basis points or so. Uh, and, uh, I mean, both are negatively correlated. Yields go up. Tech stocks, typically, historically speaking, have are been under pressure. U.S. markets, by the way, are uh, out on a holiday today. So there's no action which you should expect from later in the day because uh, U.S. is uh, not going to be trading. Just one thing I want to mention about the U.S., that over the next one month, according to many estimates, uh, we in the, th this is in the U.S., we will see one of the largest liquidity shocks uh, you know, ever, a monthly liquidity shocks ever. This is largely because the debt ceiling is no longer an issue and the Treasury in the U.S. will need to rebuild its reserves. It's a technical thing, but over the next month, this will play out. More on this later, but I just wanted to put this up uh, before we go any further. Now, let's just come to the market here. On Friday, the Nifty held the low, which uh, it made on Thursday. Thursday, remember, the last Thursday, we had a bit of a correction, uh, and that sparked uh, fears that maybe this is getting a little overdone, but Friday, uh, we were right back. We held Thursday's low of 18,669 and made one more high on Friday. This is uh, important. Now, the Nifty must stay above this level, which is 18,669, for the higher top, higher bottom formation to hold. Uh, so, very near term, that is the level to watch out for. Uh, and of course, on the upside, it is 18,887, 18,888, which is the all time high. Now, the Nifty Bank also bounced from its 40 day exponential moving average and got to 61.8% retracement of the recent fall. When I say recent fall, uh, from uh, 44,500 to the lows that we had last Thursday. So we got to within 61.8% retracement with Friday's rally. Uh, and uh, this is supportive. Bank Nifty has support at its 40-day exponential moving average, which is 43,443. The resistance now comes in at 44,500, 44,499. It's a level we've put out for the last many weeks, but of course, without a success. The Nifty Bank has been kind of uh, twiddling its thumbs, not really giving a big decisive break, a breakout or a breakdown. Now, mid caps and small caps had another fantastic week. Both indices were up about 3% Friday to Friday. I just want to put this up, uh, I mean, you know, just a, a data point to p not ponder over, but be mindful of. The relative strength index, which is a simple but very effective uh, sort of, uh, you know, way of looking whether the market is getting into very overbought or very over oversold territory, is now flashing, I would say, amber to red. So the nifty mid-cap RSI is at 86. The small-cap RSI is at 84. Anything over 70 tends to be read as overbought. We are at 86 and 84. So it's entirely possible that over the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks or so, we see a little bit of a pullback. Uh, and it would, it would be absolutely acceptable. It would be absolutely healthy as well. You know, uh, this also, be, by the way, tells you, it tells you that it's overbought. It also tells you that the market is in very strong hands. So, you know, uh, a pullback and then an up move, perhaps, I think, is the, uh, it would be ideal. I mean, I would even uh, go, uh, go ahead to say that it would be ideal if that were to pan out, an orderly kind of a pullback and then, I mean, a move higher once again. So keep this in mind. And of course, I'll end with the, the uh, little bit of the monsoon progress, which seems to be stalling a little bit. I mean, you know, we are we had uh, a little bit of rain, but largely that monsoon uh, that uh, uh, you know 
<coughs> cyclone related, uh, but no monsoons in Maharashtra yet. And by all accounts, that has already been delayed. That's a very important data point that you need to be mindful of over the next one, one and a half months or so. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all the earnings of the rural companies are, you know, linked to how the monsoon is yeah. going to behave. So yeah. that is, uh, you know, the big trigger for sure. But I think we're just quibbling with a few points here and there. We are like virtually at all-time highs. Yeah. So, you know, the uptrend in the market is intact and that is the moot point at the moment. Uh, all-time highs are likely either today or due in the course of this week. Uh, but the big story has been that the buy-on-dips trend is something that continues. In fact, if you look at it, both foreign and domestic investors bought in the cash markets on Friday. FI has bought about 800 crores. DI has bought almost 700 crores. And if you look at it put together now, in just four trading sessions, we've seen buying of 7,300 crores from the foreign investor. So the money is coming in thick and fast, and hence the kind of outperformance that the Indian markets have seen. Uh, a lot of the macro data is also positive. We were earlier talking about, you know, the PMI numbers, the GST collections, the inflation cooling off. The latest to add to that is that the direct tax collections have also picked up quite a bit. In FY24 so far, it's an 11.5% up move that we've seen in India's direct tax collection. So that is another, you know, feather in the cap for the Indian markets, that is. Um, as we begin trade today, there are some weak global cues. The markets are not, the U.S. markets are not trading tomorrow, uh, tonight. But overnight on Friday, you had a little bit of a cool off, a hundred point lower on the Dow. The S&P 500 broke its six-day winning streak. But give and take everything, it's been five weeks of a rally for the S&P 500. So as Prashant was saying, some cool off perhaps uh, could be the need of the hour. But the buy on dips continues. European markets closed higher. Uh, a lot of the traders were digesting the ECB rate hike. Uh, but nevertheless, a good gain of almost 1, 1.5% across the European markets. But let's see. Uh, it's a long week ahead uh, and the bulls definitely have tightened their grip on the market. So I guess it's just a matter of time before the party continues. Oh, absolutely. And the kind of momentum that we saw on Friday, folks, I just want to point out, it was not a market that was led by two or three stocks higher. You know, it was across the board. Every sector, barring IT because of that news that we had from TCS, barring that, everything was firing on all cylinders within the large cap space, within mid caps. So there was very serious momentum, broad-based momentum in the market. Let's see if we got a follow-up of that kind of strength that we saw uh, you know, last week on Friday in particular, or whether today is going to be a bit of a more cautious day, given the fact that global queues are uh, not raging away, if I could say. Uh, they're a little more measured. Uh, I'll just add geopolitics to the mix for uh, in terms of the queues that we'll watch out for. Interesting action lined up today. This is the first time after that whole spy balloon incident between uh, the U.S. and China that we have the U.S. Secretary of State in China, in Beijing, to meet, uh, you know, a couple of the top leaders, including the foreign minister. So that's going to be interesting. From our perspective, it'll be far more important, of course, to look out for all the headlines and the announcements around PM Modi's visit to the U.S., which kicks off on the 21st of June, so this week itself. Uh, defense stocks have been on a tear, and, you know, every, everyone's talking about that, uh, you know, uh, tie-up uh, with respect to engines with GE. So we'll watch out for more headlines, drones, etc. So this will be an interesting area that I'll look out for, for sure. I uh, just want to add that uh, in terms of the monsoon scare that uh, Prashant alluded to, we are already down about 30 to 35 percent, the deficit for the month of June, because monsoons have been you know, really pushed back. And there are some concerns already on Kharif sowing. Uh, it should have already started uh, by now. You know, you have rice, paddy, oil seeds, pulses, all of those crops. Sowing hasn't begun. The ground is not ready. So some of that concern perhaps will temper the enthusiasm a little bit, but we're hoping that monsoons revive now that the, the cyclone is behind uh, without touch with any uh, major disruption to life or to property. And we're hoping that maybe we will see a revival. In fact, you'll hear more from the Met as we go along on the show. So lots lined up, some sense of caution, but I guess we're starting off uh, with a very optimistic frame of mind. All right, and absolutely we are. Uh, you know, before we go any further, let's quickly tell you what's lined up in the first half hour of the show today. We'll get you updates from markets across the globe. Dean Kim of William O'Neill will join in to discuss the global trade setup. Our research team gets you the top 10 stocks to watch out for the day. At about 8.30 this morning, we'll have uh, our market expert, Prakash Devan, joining in uh, to weigh in on specific stocks and, of course, the cues that he deems important. All right. Uh, well, let's begin the day with some opinion coming through. First up on the equity side, we have Chetan State of Namura, who says that they are tactically positive on Asian stocks as the AI theme, still a resilient U.S. economy, and China's stimulus hopes will likely support Asian stocks. He says, however, in the medium term, they are concerned about the U.S. slowdown and recession risks, but the timing is uncertain for us. Uh, he says the timing of the weakening in the U.S. labor market and consumption will matter for stocks as this is when the market will likely view it as a confirmation of a U.S. recession. 
He notes that all past 12 recessions since the World War II have seen stocks weaken uh, into or during the recession, including the mild recessions that have taken place in the past. So a bit concerned about the US slowdown. Okay, so that's a call coming in on the equities. By the way, folks, I didn't mention in the Paris Air Show, uh, you know, we might just see Indigo top Air India's order. Air India hit the headlines with a 470 aircraft order. The expectations are this week, uh, Indigo will go ahead and order 500 <coughs> planes. So that's another big one to watch out for. And let's see even if the stock has any action around that. Uh, actually, plenty of stock-specific action to talk about today as well. So in our special top 10 segment, we will be covering the likes of Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Hindustan Aeronautics, l and uh, GUFIC Biosciences, Manapuram Finance, RPG Life Sciences, Gateway District Parks, Axis Cades uh, and uh, ONGC. These are stocks on the back of positive news flow. Havels is the one that's on the red, likely to be on the red, on the uh, back of some negative news flow. So we'll tell you more about this in just a bit. Okay, well, uh, Dean Kim is head of global research product at William O'Neill and Company. He's joining us now. Uh, Dean, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. I mean, you closely watch charts. Uh, so let me put some uh, technical data point uh, to you. Uh, the mid-cap and the small-cap index is basically what is uh, rallying and giving us this feeling of exuberance here in India. Uh, the relative strength index for both the mid-cap and the small-cap indices are now at about 86 and 84, respectively. Uh, it's a simple technical indicator used to gauge uh, whether markets are overbought, and uh, uh, they seem to be. How should one read this, Dean? Yeah, I mean, we've noticed uh, basically in India, the small caps, micro caps, um, they have been, you know, the lion's share of relative strength performance. Uh, it's interesting that the larger cap stocks in India uh, has lower relative strength. But what I would say is, you know, from a technical perspective, relative strength is certainly one indicator that we do pay attention to. Uh, but I would say, you know, uh, the other things that uh, we, we ought to pay attention to is, uh, are they coming out of, are they setting up in an early stage base? Are they breaking out or are they breaking down? Uh, so I would use uh, those types of uh, indicators uh, to better gauge whether, you know, in terms of your investment decision. Um, and so I am noticing uh, many names that are sort of extended in India. Uh, you know, they're breaking, they, they did break out from late stage bases. And those are the ones that, uh, you know, we ought to be trimming and then looking for the ones that are breaking out from early stage bases. Uh, but, you know, relative strength is definitely an important um, signal, uh, but I would also pay attention to others. All right. Uh, Dean, hi, good morning. Appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, in terms of individual stocks or sectors, uh, the sector that has rallied the most this year has been autos. And now lately in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a resumption of the metals uh, stocks as well. Uh, where do your preferences lie technically for the next couple of months? Yeah, uh, we're, we're noticing definitely, uh, you know, cap equipment names. Um, they have been doing very well, but, um, you know, we are seeing a lot of names in that front. Um, and then I would say, uh, you know, consumer finance companies, they have been doing quite well. And uh, just recently, a couple of tech names are starting to come up. For example, Route Mobile. Uh, that's breaking out from an early stage base, uh, as well as uh, Tata Communication. Uh, so that's that's something new that I've noticed in the last couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, the good thing about Indian market is the breadth is quite strong, um, and there's always going to be opportunities. Uh, but you know, within cap equipment, I would say you know Bharat uh, Electronics, uh, Crystal, you know PNC Infratech, you know th names like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, consumer cyclical, you got two, two investments, uh, Tata consumer products, Astro, uh, those types of names. And then in financial, yeah, it's interesting. The money center banks in India, is sort of, uh, fading at the moment, still consolidating. Uh, so I wouldn't be that concerned, uh, just waiting for the right time to jump into those names. Uh, but we haven't seen any kind of major breakouts yet. Um, I think Indusind Bank uh, is setting up quite well on the bank side, but you ha you also have Access Bank uh, as well as uh, consumer finance companies um, like uh, 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 Angel One, perhaps. Uh, that's more of an investment manager, but um, then I think you also have other real estate related companies as well. 
Mm, okay, Dean, so you're seeing lots of, uh, you know, uh, individual action in stocks. But let me ask you about the headline indices here in India as well, whether it is the Nifty or the Bank Nifty. We are very close to that all-time high mark on the Nifty itself. Do you see a big breakout at the headline index level or do you see more of this ranging action to continue? Uh, and, you know, do any of the key indices make a good bet for you at this point? Yeah, um, the you know, I look at the Sensex and it's been holding up quite well. Um, you know, it's above key moving averages. Really, the next resistance level is going to be uh, the last December high. On the Sensex, it's, what, 63,583, somewhere along that line. Uh, but as long as we continue to see the index sort of uh, finding support at the short-term moving averages, um, I, I think it has a good chance to, you know, break above that resistance level. Uh, so, you know, the reason why I say that is on a global basis, we are seeing strength. Um, for example, in Asia, Hong Kong was just upgraded to uptrend and uh, China is, uh, you know, sort of testing the 200 day moving average. Uh, this is on the back of the central bank lowering their key midterm lending rates. Uh, so um, on a global basis, you know, uh, we are seeing strength. Now in the U.S., uh, we may see a bit of a pullback. Um, the market's uh, done quite well, uh, despite uh, last week, you know, the Fed uh, signaling two more rate hikes. I was pleasantly surprised with the action uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, th Friday, we had a bit of a pullback. Uh, but the message here is, you know, um, the, the U.S. markets look sort of short-term extended, and uh, we could see a breather. Uh, but, you know, as long as the markets find support at the short-term moving averages, uh, you know, we would consider that to be healthy. Uh, so in that kind of context, um, I think India has a chance to break above uh, the next resistance level. All right. Uh, well, on that optimistic note, we will let you go. Thanks a lot, Dean Kim, for joining in. 63,583, you said, was the next resistance on the Sensex. We're not too far away from that. Looks like we're going to scale above those levels as well. Uh, well, that's the word coming in on the index. But our list of top 10 stocks is lined up on the other side of the break. So don't go anywhere. Before we slip into a break, though, let's get you some money market views as well. First up, Parul Mittal Sinha of Standard Charter says that the dollar INR slipped below the critical threshold of 82 on a weaker dollar and positive FPI flows last week, even as consistent US dollar purchases by PSU banks capped the downside. She expects the pair to trade in a range of 81.75 to 82.25 this week. She says dollar trends in focus post a hawkish FOMC and the ECB outcome with a host of Fed speak due later this week. Well, on bonds, Parul Mittal Sinha of Standard Chartered Bank says bond yields continue to trade range-bound amid higher global yields, post a hawkish FOMC and ECB, soft domestic CPI print and good investor demand provide support. She expects the Indian 10-year benchmark yield to trade in a range of 6.95 to 7.05% this week, with a focus now on the monsoon trends given the weak start and higher domestic supply.
Well, it's been a dream run for the Indian equity markets. We are virtually at all-time highs and looks like we could be hitting that level this week itself. Our team is standing by, though, to give you the list of top stocks that you need to watch out for as we head into trade this morning. So let's welcome them on board. Folks, good morning. Uh, Ekta, let me begin with you. There's some news on DRL today. Well, yes, uh, positive news which is coming for Dr. Reddy's. The USFT has completed a GMP facility inspection, which is a general inspection of the company's API facility at Hyderabad. The plant was inspected from June 12 to 16 with zero observations. Plus, uh, they have received an establishment inspection report with a voluntary action indicated, which means that it's a green signal to the plant for their formulations facility at Shrikakulam. So there are two plants which have now been given the go-ahead in one instance by the U.S. drug regulator. That's why you could see the stock in the green today. Okay, got that, Ekta. Thanks very much. We'll watch out for Dr. Reddy's. Uh, but as I was mentioning earlier as well, I think a lot of uh, eyes are going to be on Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. And because of that, we'll watch out for big defense names like HAL. Parikshit has all the details with him. Parikshit, good morning. Well, we had reported last week that uh, the GHL deal has been done and this is at the highest political level. We're now getting to know from our sources that the technology transfer could include at least 80% technology transfer over the next three years. Top sources telling us that uh, by the end of three years, 80% uh, of the value addition to the jet engine will happen locally. Uh, the transfer of technology is going to happen in phases. We are going to be procuring uh, manufacturing parts from uh, GE as well. Now, some of the kinds of technology that we're getting through uh, General Electric, this includes uh, special coating for erosion and corrosion, repair technology for turbines, uh, compressor disc and blades, coating and machining of single crystal turbine blades. So very critical technology of uh, the GE engine parts that we're going to be getting from the U.S. It's going to happen over the next uh, three years. What we're also learning from the sources is that U.S., U.K. and France have not shared uh, technology to this extent with anyone. And we believe the process of setting up a production line, uh, the process of technology transfer will begin soon after the signing of the deal this week. All right. Uh, and that's important. Technology transfer was the one piece uh, which was missing. And that seems to be, uh, you know, at least uh, starting to happen, hopefully, as Parishit points out. Parishit, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Vivek is now joining us uh, to take us through what's the news on LNT. Larsen and Tubro. Vivek, hi, morning. Well, good morning. You know, LNT will be in focus. Two important uh, pieces of information that happened or uh, transpired over the weekend. Now, first, you know, LNT has been declared as the lowest bidder to construct almost 135 kilometers. Now, this is for Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail. Now, you know, this is the part three or C3 of the total 508 kilometer mega you know, Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed railway project and LNT's bid came in lowest at around 15,697 crore. Macquarie has written a note. What they're saying is that the order win is a key positive for LNT given the fact that the company recently missed out or, you know, narrowly on a few large order wins. So, you know, Q1 FI24 order wins this time at very strong, 26,500 crore, up almost 45% on a year-on-year -year basis. Interestingly, another development in LNT, what's actually happened is that MSCI has gone ahead and upgraded the company's ESG rating, you know, from a double uh, to a double B from an earlier single B. Now, what this basically means is that you know earlier investors who are hesitant to go ahead and invest, or sell a select group of investors who are uh, you know uh, hesitant to invest in LNT because of the smaller rating as far as the ESG was concerned, you know, now that goes ahead and opens a new avenue. It was an important trigger. MSCI uh, Macquarie believes that this is a key overhang that has been re removed as far as LNT is concerned. All right, thanks a lot for that. So a lot of positives coming through for LNT this morning. But let's get back to Ekta. She's tracking a couple of stocks. There's Manapuram Finance, RPG Life, uh, Gufik Biosciences as well. Ekta, what do you have? Well, thanks. I'll start with Gufik Bio. It's a strong run on Friday's trading session. The company has received approval from the Chinese regulator, the National Medicals Product Administration of China, for an API to manufacture an API, which is basically an anesthetic. The approval will help commercialize the said product in China and help them explore the Chinese market. RPG Life Sciences had an investor meet. A couple of takeaways include that they have implemented a growth strategy around what would be scaling up of the presence in existing products and therapies, cost optimization. There are also efforts underway to acquire company and brands that will strengthen the company's presence. 
in uh, segments such as chronic as well as speciality and RPG is expected to outperform the Indian pharma market going forward. Manapuram, the High Court of Kerala has quashed an FIR against the promoter uh, Mr. Nand Kumar, so that should definitely be a positive. RBI has also imposed a monetary penalty of around 20 lakh on the company for non-compliance of NBFC provisions, so it will be in focus on account of that. Okay, got that. We've noted those three. Eka, thanks very much. Uh, we have Surabhi now joining in. She has uh, a couple of others on her radar as well. Good morning, Surabhi. Good morning. So, first one on my radar is Gateway Disney Parks. They had an analyst meet and I have some takeaways from City. The City says they continue to maintain its market share in the key markets of NCR and Ludhiana. Their company has guided for a 10 to 10, 14 percent revenue growth in the next two financial years. Uh, the company continues to expand its network of ICDs with the acquisition of ICD at Kashipur and the land parcel at Jaipur. They are also looking to acquire two more ICDs and the company's Fagidabad terminal will also start double stacking in four to five months. Next on my radar is Havels. Now shareholders have raised concerns over the proposed remuneration that has been paid to the MD and chairman Anil Rai Gupta and the estimated remuneration for FI24 is going to be close to 29 crores. Now the company has clarified in the AGM that there is no change in the remuneration structure and the overall remuneration is 1.8% of the PBT which is well within the 5% band according to the company's act but the stock could still be under pressure just for the fact that the shareholders have raised some concerns. Next on my radar is Access Cades. Now the company is going to acquire 100% stake in Ad Solutions, a German company, in two phases. 94% of the acquisition is going to be by July 2023 and the remaining 6% by March 2025. The company specializes in automotive design and development and Access Cades has been paying 5.5 million euros, which is close to 49 crores for this acquisition. All right. Thanks a lot, Surbhi, for that. Well, let's go across to Manisha Gupta now and find out what's happening in the world of commodities, especially on crude. Manisha, hi, morning. Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, we have seen the prices start the week with a slight decline, a percentage point down, actually. And this is after 2.5% of gains in the previous week because the U.S. dollar was declining and China cut near-term and medium-term rates. But all of that really seems to be wearing off right now after the major banks have downgraded the China GDP forecast. Also, Iran crude exports have hit a new highs in 2023. So there are supplies coming in from Russia, UAE, Iran, and also Nigeria and Algeria. So many OPEC members are increasing production. Apart from that, when you look at the CFTC data that shows you that the global money managers have cut net long positions in the previous quarter by 13,000 contracts, it stands at 73,000 contracts now. So with the fundamentals easing off a bit and the, fund and the speculative money getting out of the market also seems to be weighing onto the prices today. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Manisha. Well, here's a quick recap of our top stocks. Stocks uh, with positive news flow. There's Dr. Reddy's, Hindustan Aeronautics, L&T, Gufik Biosciences, Manapuram Finance, RPG Life Sciences, Gateway District Parks, Access K Technologies and ONGC. While only one stock with negative news for today is Havels. But there are plenty of brokerages that have come out with interesting notes to focus on for the day. Surbhi is here with that list. Surbhi, over to you. Two interesting initiating coverages. The first one is on Titagar by Antique. They have a, a buy with a target price of 694. They expect Titagar to post an earnings compounded annual growth of 53% in the next three years and generate an average return on equity of over 25%. The stock has meaningfully appreciated in the past year, they've said, but, uh, you know, due to uh, leading of doubling of profits and FI23, but a 12 times FI25 earnings, they consider the stock is still cheap and does not capture the long-term growth potential. The next on my radar is Five Star Finance. Anomira has initiated coverage with a buy and a target price of 750. They say it is a highly profitable and amongst the fastest growing NBFC in a niche market. They estimate the company to deliver a 30% AUM CAGR over the next three years, driven by untapped opportunity in the MSME market, specifically in the niche small business, and also continuous expansion with 50 to 60 new branches expected to open every year. All right, uh, Surabhi, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, so those are initiations we'll keep an eye out on. We'll take a quick break here. On the other side, Prakash Devan will be joining in uh, with his take on markets uh, and uh, stocks that uh, he would want you to act on. A little later after that, we'll also connect with uh, the IMD, the METS department, to discuss the latest as far as the monsoon progress is concerned. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. So global markets have taken uh, have been taking it a little easy because of that handover that we got from Wall Street, where U.S. markets finally pulled back after consecutive six days of buying. Uh, the SGX Nifty is actually still managing a little bit of green, but if you see some of the others in the region, uh, there's some shades of red. Hong Kong, for instance, has been down by about a percent uh, thereabouts. Mainland China is slightly lower as well. Let's see if we can kind of battle against this and continue our northward march, considering the kind of momentum that we had out here. Uh, well, let's get the conversation going then. Prakash Divan is joining in. Prakash, great to have you with us. And, you know, what a end to Friday that we had. And now we're starting off this brand new week. You know, I first want to get your sense on this whole clutch of defense stocks because there will be a lot of chatter. We probably will see this GEHAL deal get signed as well. Now, my question is, how much more upside uh, in, the, in the near to medium term? Uh, and there's a whole bunch of stocks, right, from your BEL to your Astra Micro, uh, Micro to your MTAR to HAL itself. Would you look at the basket? And if yes, uh, which ones in the basket do you like more? Uh, good morning, Sir B. So, yes, uh, lots, lots of action expected. Uh, PM Modi's visit will not uh, go without any uh, follow-through, I'm sure. And, and this time it looks like, you know, we are entering a space which hitherto was uh, always like, you know, the exclusive club of some of the developed markets and, and, and we did get to participate. So you will see a whole new uh, era of growth and learning for these companies or learning and growth in that order. So there is going to be some time lag before, you know, they start benefiting from this entire uh, entry into this haloed club. Mm. Oops. So, OK, I think there's some issue with that video of Prakash. Uh, we'll just get to that in a bit. But of course, he's talking about the entire, uh, you know, uh, defense space and the big moves that we've seen over there. HL, of course, will be one of the big stocks to focus on, as uh, our colleague Parikshit was just telling us, that deal uh, that HL has with uh, GE that has uh, sort of fructified. And uh, now the technology transfer will happen in uh, phases. So, I mean, HL, of course, has had a dream run. It's up 100% in the last 12 months. But now there is incremental positive news uh, for that company. So on uh, Friday, I think, Surabhi, you had uh, the shipbuilders all rally again, right? Oh, had, yes. It was a huge I think Cochin, Nazgaon, Garden Absolutely. Reach. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Prakash briefly mentioned that Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, defense is such an area that, mm. you know, a, a push by the sovereign to kind yeah. of uh, force the other side to exchange mm. and give technology yeah. I mean, yeah. I think uh, it, it happens at a different level. Absolutely. And uh, companies, of course, I mean, uh, will execute and uh, they will yeah. be the beneficiaries and investors, etc. But I think this, uh, we will see. And I think Parikshit reported the story two weeks ago as well that, yeah. you know, this deal with the U.S. Uh, will forward. be signed. When, and, of course, there were more details today in terms of technology yeah. transfer, etc. Yeah. So I think extremely important. I don't, I don't know if the sh rally in shipbuilders is also predicated on the a uh, fact that I mean I think one of them tied up with Thyssen Group Thyssen recently. Group, yeah, mm. that was but, I think a uh, big one. It's going to be uh, an interesting one. Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Which is why I mean we'll we'll ask Kaprakash once he gets back. The only thing is that a lot of these stocks have uh, already sort of they've been bursting through exactly. the charts, going through the, the roof, including the drone makers. Um, uh, you know, and the smaller stocks. So you have the the bigger names like HAL, and then you have the the smaller companies, including like an MTAR, which are uh, you know providing a lot of these uh, precision systems. Uh, to the DRDO, etc., a lot of these other organizations. Prakash, shall we, we have you back. So the question is, what to pick from this basket? So, you know, uh, given the fact that this time is going to be a lot of headway in the aerospace side, uh, <clears throat> Oops, okay, uh, I, think, I think once again an issue there. But, you know, just want to mention that the valuations for some of these companies have are now starting to look uh, a bit on the higher side. So if you pull up, uh, you know, some of these names, Bharat Electronics, for example, is already trading at 20 times FY25 earnings. Uh, the other expensive stock is BEML, is trading at about 20 times, 21 times actually, FY25 earnings. A couple of these others as well, you know, Bharat Dynamics, after the steep run up, is trading at 20 times forward as well. So, I mean, yeah, the valuations, of course, after the big run up. It's only at 20 times, it's expensive. <laughs> Compared <laughs> well, to their own historic valuations, is what I'm talking you know, about. I'll, we'll put you this, can't compare them to FMCG companies. We'll, we'll put, this, uh, put this data out. Uh, I was looking at the number of companies in India which are now trading at over 50 times a price yeah. to earnings. Mm -hmm. And the number is through the roof. I mean, and I'm talking about small caps, mid caps, not just, I mean, consumer names, which have al always yeah. traditionally been expensive. So It's like 50 is the new 15 in India, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. You know, the market here has always been expensive, but, uh, yeah. we, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, reached another Absolutely. level. But, you know, you know uh, Prashant, uh, yeah, you were mentioning monsoon. Mm. So I, I think the best question is to put it to the, you know, to the experts, because this uh, week 
progress that we've seen, Maharashtra has yet to be fully covered. This is causing some concern. And there are already, you know, agricultural experts talking about how Kharif sowing is getting delayed. Uh, Mahesh Palawat, Vice President of uh, Meteorology and uh, Climate Change at SkyMet Weather is now joining in. Uh, Mahesh, hi, good morning. Thanks for taking this call. So now that uh, the cyclonic activity is probably behind us, what is the progress that we can expect, A, and how severe is the impact right now on uh, on the early sowing trends? Uh, see, now the uh, monsoon is still lagging behind over West Coast. Initially, the progress was very good after the onset of monsoon on 8th of uh, June. Uh, monsoon reached up, up to Ratnagiri uh, in next two to three days. But uh, due to the formation of a cyclone, Vapor Joy, uh, it stalled uh, there, and now the winds are strengthening over South Peninsula, particularly over Kerala and Karnataka, and monsoon will progress into interior peninsula uh, in next, uh, uh, say, 24 to 48 hours. But the winds, lower-level winds, uh, will get strengthened over west coast of uh, Maharashtra, particularly Maharashtra coast and South Gujarat coast, by 23rd of June. So we have to wait for another three to four days for monsoon to reach uh, uh, Maharashtra, and thereafter, there will be steady progress in interior parts as well, like Madhya Maharashtra, Marathwada, Vidarva, all these areas. Uh, they will also start receiving good rain. So uh, the Kharif sowing is uh, delayed by, say, uh, 10 to 15 days. But now the things are uh, looking very bright. Uh, mm. We have to wait another three to four days at least. Mm. Uh, Mahesh, uh, you know, j j over uh, June, July, uh, August and September, I mean, June is an important month, right? I mean, wh typically yes. what... What kind of uh, rainfall do we get in, in June uh, over uh, uh, the, out of the entire monsoon rainfall? Uh, the overall uh, rainfall that mm. uh, 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 usually uh, country received around 80 uh, centimeter of rain uh, mm. uh, throughout the pan India. Uh, but June is uh, only, uh, June rainfall is around 16 to 17 centimeter. And July and August, uh, they are 30 and 31 centimeters. And then again, September is 16 to 17 centimeters. So uh, June and September uh, uh, receive uh, almost half of the uh, rainfall, uh, uh, which we get in July and August. So mm -hmm. the rainfall will start increasing in the month of July. But as the monsoon is this year was weak, onset was weak, and uh, cyclone has uh, pulled the moisture away, that's why the uh, onset of monsoon is delayed, but now the rains will be satisfactory until until uh, first 10 days of July at least. And you're saying that, have to wait and it. you're saying that uh, rain uh, monsoon will progress into interior Maharashtra by the 23rd of June. Uh, uh, 23rd, uh, 23rd of June, it will be over coastal areas, and thereafter, in next subsequent two, uh, two days, it will be progressing in interior Maharashtra, like uh, South Madhya Maharashtra, Bidarbha, Marathwada. And okay. thereafter, gradually over North Madhya Maharashtra. And, right? this, and uh, this can be made up? The, the, the deficit we've seen so far can be made up? I mean, we've seen that in the past, Mahesh? Uh, it is difficult uh, because uh, rain will be good, but it, this will not make the entire deficit, but some improvement will be there. But uh, first 10 days of July seems to be very good in terms of rainfall, Pan India. Uh, so the uh, it will make up. Uh, How much is the deficit, budget. Mahesh? Uh, there was one figure that I read was around 35% because June has been a complete washout so far. How much is the deficit yeah, uh, as of now? Uh, the deficit was, uh, it climbed up to 54%, but now it has reduced to 34% as the rain activities have intensified over Gujarat, uh, Rajasthan, and now Madhya Pradesh will also receive very heavy downpour in subsequent uh, four to five days. Uh, the overall deficit is reduced. Uh, but now the rain activities will be all over the places from uh, during next, uh, from uh, you can say 23rd or 24th uh, June onward, except uh, parts of Western Rajasthan and Gujarat. Okay. Uh, Mahesh, would you change your uh, sort of estimate for the long period uh, average? I mean, what the total estimate you have uh, in terms of how uh, monsoon we, or not yet? Yeah. Yes, no, no. We uh, we have predicted monsoon to be 94 percent of uh, long period average. That is below normal, and it seems to be like this. Although rainfall will be good, because until now the uh, the rain, uh, monsoon has not progressed as uh, as per norms. So uh, East India is also uh, lagging behind. Entire country is lagging behind uh, by at least uh, 10 days. So now, although the monsoon will make up, but the uh, as the El Nino of impact will be seen in the month of August, September. Uh, so we, we think that monsoon will be uh, 
marginally below normal it will but uh, the distribution will not be uh, very skewed so central india and east india and south peninsula uh, will receive satisfactory rainfall uh, however the western parts of rajasthan uh, swarasha and kutch and some parts of northwest india uh, may lag behind All right, uh, Mr. Palavat, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. So that's the IMD. Let's get back to discussing about the markets. Prakash Devan is still with us. Prakash, I wanted your thoughts on you know how all of this would affect uh, some of the rural focus stocks, right? I mean, we've seen uh, big movers come in the form of say an M and M or even an Escorts, so not just in the auto space but the other rural names in the FMCG space as well. Um, would this deficit in the monsoon in June would it affect you? Because June is the most important month as far as the agricultural season is concerned as well. uh would it affect stocks or would you continue to have your bullish views here and if yes which ones would you be a bit cautious on now so so that's an important point because uh, uh you know while the element of agriculture in the contribution to the economy is reducing with every passing year we still have a significant uh, you know this thing uh, weightage in that sense coming from there but this time around what would happen is uh you it could lead to a little bit of shortages and deficits in the output and hence inflationary uh, you know impact on that but i think the only segment that will probably get uh, impacted is the input agri input side i don't think uh, tractors and the consumption side or the demand side from uh, stemming from the rural markets is going to be an issue at, at you know in the medium term but in the short run you'll probably have a uh, probably a deferment of purchases on on the agri input side which is one of the peak uh you know phases for the entire year so that's that's where you need to be cautious you know whether it's uh, agrochemicals whether it's uh, fertilizer so that's that's the uh, space which could kind of get stretched if this goes on so i i'm not too worried about uh, the impact on the monsoon because it always happens we either have a bad start or a delayed start or a delayed ending you know or a, short, a quicker ending so you know uh, that's that's always going to be the vagaries of the uh, uh, you know climatic change but I think fertilizer is that pocket which you need to be a bit cautious on if it goes on, if it prolongs. Otherwise, uh, demand side, I'm sure post this season you'll see a restocking in in that sense or a rebuilding of demand coming back big time. Mm. All right, uh, Prakash, uh, you know, stay with us. <clears throat> I remember uh, the cyclone was supposed to push the monsoon in, and uh, you know, Mahesh was or the sky minister telling us that it's take actually taken away a moisture yeah. and it's actually hurt mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. monsoon progress. So who knows? I'll we'll leave it to the experts, yeah. especially with regards to uh, rains. But uh, as he said, let's hope. I mean, overall, over uh, the four-month period, uh, there are sufficient rains. We'll slip into a quick break here. Uh, Anuj will be joining in with a quick trade setup. Post that, we'll get you the top stocks for the day. Uh, our technical and FNO experts will get you more trades. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Uh, there's, what, uh, 13 minutes to go for the pre-open session. Anuj is here, as always, for a quick setup as he sees it. Anuj, hi, morning. Morning, Prashant. Well, uh, good chance of a new all-time high, right? I mean, uh, well, it teased uh, us on Friday. It almost uh, went there, 22 points within that. Uh, U.S. markets closed today, of course, so that's a good sign, though global queues are slightly mixed. But the market's been very strong. The broad market in particular, advanced decline, has been very strong. The mid-cap index has been hitting new highs uh, all five days of last week. Uh, I think the stock that's really come back in limelight is Reliance. Uh, that's up 4.5% this month. And it's showing leadership signs uh, after consolidating a 200-day moving average for better part of a month or so. I think that's the stock which is showing signs that perhaps it can take Nifty to new highs. Uh, one more thing, uh, as we discussed in Editor's Roundtable as well, the number of stocks at new highs is still okay, 207. Uh, euphoria normally happens when this number starts to cross 500. On the Nifty, the first support zone is 18.710 to 18.760. My sense is if you get any dip, that could be an entry opportunity. The bigger support is 18.550 to 18.600. And the first resistance, of course, is 18.800 to 18.888, the all-time high, which is where we are right now. Uh, on the Bank Nifty, on Friday, we had a bit of a surge. Uh, here, the support is 43.750 to 43.800, going by the options data. And then the Friday low, which is somewhere around 43.550 or thereabout. At higher level, of course, you'll face resistance at 44,000 to 44,200 and bigger resistance at 44,300 to 44,500. But uh, as I said, my sense is if the market has to go to all-time high, perhaps the stock that could do it is Reliance. Okay, all right, got that. Anuj, thanks very much uh, for your uh, you know, view and the setup. So let's see if you can get that all-time high. Uh, Prakash, uh, just you know, while we're talking about all things up, Wanted to get your call on TCS as well because of the news that we got on Friday. The stock interestingly kind of, you know, took it in its stride, I could say. The cut was only a percent, percent and a half. Uh, but what's the sense? Will IT, uh, you know, see any more incremental selling or do you think the, the selling is done? So IT will become a bit of a non-event till we hear from the companies again uh, come July. So, should we, you know, I think essentially IT will behave slightly differently, uh, 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 you know, which is a bit deviant from the operational performance. You know, the stocks will behave a bit differently is my sense. The reason is uh, there are people who like heavy-weighted IT plays which give you a very clear runway for the next few years. Now, if that is the issue, uh, if that's the kind of deciding factor, around that parameter, if you look at a lot of the bottoming out has already happened, and especially the likes of HCL Tech, Wipro, uh, even Infosys for that matter, I don't see any reason why they could be takers for that. Uh, while we know that currently the business uh, situation might not be the best, uh, the, the American market will, the U.S. market will probably start giving you some feelers of a change in outlook and globally. I mean, this has come from Europe, the TCS debacle or the, the uh, you know this news flow. But I don't think it's a large trend that is in the making. So this could be one off. And they've started going for smaller contracts to to diversify the risk, be risk themselves. So with that all in place. And, and there's so much of stuff happening on AI and IoT and ML. So it's not just the good old, you know, ITS digitization that will uh, uh, that that is something they have to depend on. So I think there are different pockets of potential revenue build up from different geographies. And and as they deepen the, the, that particular thing, you'll probably see IT stabilize. And that's my guess. Uh, you'll probably see uh, money moving back into IT at some stage, whether it happens this quarter after this quarter numbers or probably the September end quarters. But I, I don't see any big risks out there, especially with the large players. All right. Uh, well, stay on, Prakash. We'll come back to you for more. For now, we, you know, we're uh, contending with all-time highs, right? So there's a, definitely a big party underway in, on Dalal Street. Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani are joining us now. Uh, Sudarshan, we're, of course, just quibbling about a few points here and there. We are virtually at all-time highs. But, uh, you know, a slightly longer-term question. What do you do at a time like this, both as a long-term retail investor and as a trader? Is this a time to continue putting money to work or are you a bit cautious at these levels? Yeah, good morning, Sonia. See, as a retail investor, I should wait for a correction. Corrections come at least twice a year. So this is not a time to invest if you are a retail investor. But for traders, uh, we are looking at a very short-term time frame. The trend is up. So far as the trend is up, we must be long in this market. And that's the view on the Nifty today. The bank Nifty is a complete avoid. It's locked in a trading range. Inside that trading range, it's moving up. It means nothing. Uh, it's not tradable. But the Nifty is making, and it's virtually at all-time highs, and it's probably going higher. So 
for the nifty the trade is if you are long stay long if you are not long or if you want to add positions wait for a sharp intraday dip even today we could get one somewhere around 17725 close by and then go long in it so for a trader there is only one trade be on the long side mm. <clears throat> gentlemen good morning uh, mr darshan and mitesh mitesh uh, are all highs created equal <laughs> i mean just uh, uh, just tongue in cheek because you know we'll make a new high we're almost there as sudarshan also pointed out but you know there's no it's, it's not going to do it with some big gusto and a flourish right a middling kind of price action for a long time just under it and then finally we hit it uh you or you think i mean once you are once you cross above the previous high momentum will pick up purely on the nifty morning prashant i think typically that is the case that uh, getting past uh, uh, all time highs means that uh, historically uh, there is no historical support levels or so, so supply level or a pivot uh, which is there in sight and therefore the market momentum should be good but here i have two things to observe one the bank nifty which still forms a significant part of the nifty i think is underperforming it's not making new highs and in the short term doesn't look very strong or convincing to me yet i think nifty managed to do uh, uh, to make a fresh high on friday now if you look at the hourly and the two hourly charts uh, you know starting from uh, sometime in uh, may i think we had a high of uh, 18450 on the 15th of may and then we had a high of 18660 uh, somewhere on the 30th of may then a high of 18775 on the 8th of june join those three rising highs and you get a line which is now a supply line which is now currently at about levels of 18900 So in that sense, I think uh, it's making a, what I would call as a contracting rising pattern. Beyond eighteen thousand nine hundred, I think I would be very very bullish, and I would look at an extreme, uh, you know, a strong momentum coming to the play. But till we cross that, since we have a well defined supply line, I think I'll wait for that to be cleared out. Also, given the fact that the bank Nifty not uh, showing extreme signs of positiveness is uh, suggesting me to hold my horses. But I think otherwise, this is a market which is very good in the sense of the bread, the mid cap index, the small cap index, the small cap uh, stock setups, and mid cap stock setups are very very positive. So clearly, trade with long bias, but maybe not focus too much on the index, but on the stocks. Mm, I guess that's exactly what uh, most people in the market, whether it's retail investors, traders, right? They've uh, all been doing that. So Darshan, uh, morning. I heard you say that uh, you get into the Nifty if you get levels of around seventeen thousand. Uh, 825 thereabouts, right? But that, that's a thousand point point dip. Uh, is that what you said? No, that's a thousand points lower than what I said. 18,725 or whereabouts? That's a hundred. 18,775. Okay, I was like, okay, if, if we get that thousand point dip, then I think the whole world will rush in, but it's not coming, right? Okay, fair enough. Let's uh, get to stocks, gentlemen. So, Darshan, what are your picks? Well, uh, you know, it's mainly buying. There's nothing else to do. Tata Power is a buy. It's in a trading range. Sooner or later, it's expected to break on the upside. Stop under 218, 218. NMDC is my only intraday short. The stock is in a clear and distinct downtrend, which is surprising given the nature of the market. So that's an intraday short with a stop above 169, 109. And finally, Bajaj Finance is a buy with a stop under 7000. My last trade is also a buying opportunity, Maruti. is making a some kind of a bullish flag but some of these patterns are also visible only to the person who is seeing them so don't go overboard if the mark if the maruti shows some strength it's worth buying into that would be a confirmation buy with a stop under 9450 all right and mitesh how about you what would be on your buy and sell list today morning sonia more of buy calls very clearly the bias is uh, to trade with uh, long ideas uh, indian hotels is a buy with a stop at 396 targets of 421 Avenue Finance is a buy with a stop at 297 for targets of 320. Ipka Labs is a buy with a stop at 724. I would look for a target of around 760 to begin with. And one sell TCS. I think there's also some news flow, but I have a sell over here with a target of 3100 and a stop just about 3200. Okay, Whoa. let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with the pre-opening rates on the other side, and we'll also have Aniket Mathre of HDFC Securities. The auto stocks have been the biggest gainers this year. More on that coming up.
Welcome back. Uh, there's what, uh, 13 minutes to go for the pre-open session. Anuj is here as always for a quick setup as he sees it. Anuj, hi, morning. Morning, Prashant. Well, uh, good chance of a new all-time high, right? I mean, uh, well, it teased uh, us on Friday. It almost uh, went there, 22 points within that. Uh, US markets closed today, of course, so that's a good sign, though global queues are slightly mixed. But the market's been very strong. The broad market in particular, advanced decline, has been very strong. The mid-cap index has been hitting new highs uh, all five days of last week. Uh, I think the stock that's really come back in limelight is Reliance. Uh, that's up 4.5% this month. And it's showing leadership signs uh, after consolidating a 200-day moving average for a better part of a month or so. I think that's the stock which is showing signs that perhaps it can take Nifty to new highs. Uh, one more thing, uh, as we discussed in Editor's Roundtable as well, the number of stocks at new highs is still okay, 207. Uh, euphoria normally happens when this number starts to cross 500. On the Nifty, the first support zone is 18,710 to 18,760. My sense is if you get any dip, that could be an entry opportunity. The bigger support is 18,550 to 18,600. And the first resistance, of course, is 18,800 to 18,888, the all-time high, which is where we are right now. Uh, on the bank nifty, on Friday, we had a bit of a surge. Uh, here, the support is 43,750 to 43,800 going by the options data. And then the Friday low, which is somewhere around 43,550 or thereabout. At higher level, of course, you'll face resistance at 44,000 to 44,200 and bigger resistance at 44,300 to 44,500. But uh, as I said, my sense is if the market has to go to all-time high, perhaps the stock that could do it is Reliance. Okay, all right, got that, Anuj. Thanks very much uh, for your uh, you know, view and the setup. So let's see if you can get that all-time high. Uh, Prakash, uh, just you know, while we're talking about all things up, wanted to get your call on TCS as well because of the news that we got on Friday. The stock interestingly kind of you know, took it in its stride, I could say. The cut was only a percent, percent and a half. Uh, but what's the sense? Will IT uh, you know, see any more incremental selling or do you think the, the selling is done? So IT will become a bit of a non-event till we hear from the companies again uh, come July. So, should we, you know, I think essentially IT will behave slightly differently, uh, 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 you know, which is a bit deviant from the operational performance. And, you know, the stocks will behave a bit differently is my sense. The reason is, uh, there are people who like heavy-weighted IT plays, which give you a very clear runway for the next few years. Now, if that is the issue, uh, if that's the kind of deciding factor, around that parameter, if you look at a lot of the bottoming out has already happened, and especially the likes of HCL Tech, Wipro, uh, even Infosys for that matter, I don't see any reason why they couldn't be takers for that. Uh, while we know that currently the business uh, situation might not be the best. Uh, the, the American market will, the U.S. market will probably start giving you some feelers of a change in outlook and globally. I mean, this has come from Europe, the TCS debacle or the, the uh, you know, this news flow. But I don't think it's a large trend that is in the making. So this could be one off. And they've started going for smaller contracts to, to diversify the risk, be risk themselves. So with that all in place, and, and there's so much of stuff happening on AI and IoT and ML. So it's not just the good old, you know, ITS digitization that will, uh, uh, that that is something they have to depend on. So I think there are different pockets of potential revenue build up from different geographies. And, and as they deepen the, the, that particular thing, you'll probably see IT stabilize. And that's my guess. Uh, you'll probably see uh, money moving back into IT at some stage, whether it happens this quarter, after this quarter numbers, or probably the September end quarters. But I, I don't see any big risks out there, especially with the large players. All right. Uh, well, stay on, Prakash. We'll come back to you for more. For now, we you know we're uh, contending with all-time highs, right? So there's a definitely a big party underway in, on Dalal Street. Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani are joining us now. Uh, Sudarshan, we're of course just quibbling about a few points here and there. We are virtually at all-time highs, but uh, you know, a slightly longer-term question: What do you do at a time like this, both as a long-term retail investor and as a trader? Is this a time to continue putting money to work, or are you? a bit cautious at these levels. Yeah, good morning, Sonia. See, as a retail investor, I should wait for a correction. Corrections come at least twice a year. So this is not a time to invest if you are a retail investor. But for traders, uh, we are looking at a very short-term time frame. The trend is up. So far as the trend is up, we must be long in this market. And that's the view on the Nifty today. The bank Nifty is a complete avoid. It's locked in a trading range. Inside that trading range, it's moving up. It means nothing. Uh, it's not tradable. But the Nifty is making, and it's virtually at all-time highs, and it's probably going higher. So 
for the nifty the trade is if you are long stay long if you are not long or if you want to add positions wait for a sharp intraday dip even today we could get one somewhere around 17725 close by and then go long in it so for a trader there is only one trade be on the long side hmm. <clears throat> gentlemen good morning uh, mr darshan and mitesh mitesh uh, are all highs created equal <laughs> i mean just uh, uh, just tongue in cheek because you know we'll make a new high we're almost there as sudarshan also pointed out but you know there's no it's, it's not going to do it with some big gusto and a flourish right a middling kind of price action for a long time just under it and then finally we hit it uh you or you think i mean once you are once you cross above the previous high momentum will pick up purely on the nifty morning prashant i think typically that is the case that uh, getting past uh, uh, all time highs means that uh, historically uh, there is no historical support levels or so, so supply level or a pivot uh, which is there in sight and therefore the market momentum should be good but here i have two things to observe one the bank nifty which still forms a significant part of the nifty i think is underperforming it's not making any highs and in the short term doesn't look very strong or convincing to me yet i think nifty managed to do uh, uh, to make a fresh high on friday now if you look at the hourly and the two hourly charts uh, you know starting from uh, sometime in uh, may i think we had a high of uh, 18450 on the 15th of may and then we had a high of 18660 uh, somewhere on the 30th of may then a high of 18775 on the 8th of june join those three rising highs and you get a line which is now a supply line which is now currently at about levels of 18900 so in that sense i think uh, it's making a, what i would call as a contracting rising pattern beyond 18900 i think i would be very very bullish and i would look at a extreme uh, you know a strong momentum come into the play but till we cross that since we have a well defined supply line i think i'll wait for that to be cleared out also given the fact that the bank nifty not uh, showing extreme signs of positiveness is uh, suggesting me to hold my horses but i think otherwise this is a market which is very good in the sense of the breadth the mid cap index the small cap index the small cap uh, stock setups and mid cap stock setups are very very positive so clearly trade with long bias but maybe not focus too much on the index but on the stocks mm i guess that's exactly what uh, most people in the market whether it's retail investors traders right they've uh, all been doing that so darshan uh, morning i heard you say that uh, you get into the nifty if you get levels of around 17000 uh 825 there about right but that, that's a 1000 point point dip uh, is that what you said no that's a 1000 points lower than what i said 18725 or where about that's a 100 points 18000 7725 yes, yes, yes. okay i was like okay if, if we get that 1000 point dip then i think the whole world will rush in but it's not coming right okay fair enough let's uh, get to stocks gentlemen so darshan what are your picks well uh you know it's mainly buying there's nothing else to do Tata Power is a buy. It's in a trading range. Sooner or later, it's expected to break on the upside. Stop under 218, 218. NMDC is my only intraday short. The stock is in a clear and distinct downtrend, which is surprising given the nature of the market. So that's an intraday short with a stop above 169, 109. And finally, Bajaj Finance is a buy with a stop under 7000. My last trade is also a buying opportunity, Maruti. is making a some kind of a bullish flag but some of these patterns are also visible only to the person who is seeing them so don't go overboard if the mark if the maruti shows some strength it's worth buying into that would be a confirmation buy with a stop under 9450 all right and mitesh how about you what would be on your buy and sell list today morning sonia more buy calls very clearly the bias is uh, to trade with uh, long ideas uh, indian hotels is a buy with a stop at 396 targets of 421 M&M Finance is a buy with a stop at 297 for targets of 320. Ipka Labs is a buy with a stop at 724. I would look for a target of around 760 to begin with. And one sell TCS. I think there's also some news flow, but I have a sell over here with a target of 3100 and a stop just about 3200. Okay, Whoa. let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with the pre-opening rates on the other side, and we'll also have Aniket Mathre of HTSC Securities. The auto stocks have been the biggest gainers this year. More on that coming up.
Welcome back. So global markets are a little cautious. US is shut tonight, but uh, the SX Nifty is managing a little bit of green on it. So let's find out what the calls can be on the futures and options side. Chandan Taparia, derivative and technical analyst at Motilal Osal Financial Services is with us. Chandan, good morning. What are your trades today? Good morning. Thanks for having me. So finally, it's time to cheer and cherish the new lifetime high of Nifty index. Uh, it, it took almost uh, 63 days uh, in the rally of 2,000 points from 16,828 to now near to the old time high of 18,888. If I look at the Nifty data setup, uh, it's up by around 2.76% in this month and open interest added by around 27%. So after the light Y of last few months, fresh open interest added, which clearly indicates that longs are carrying their positions. The open interest is now near to 11.74 uh, million shares. So, in fact, the 15% OI added in last three days, which clearly indicates that fresh loans are being added. So, we believe that till Nifty holds above 17,676. Any small decline in the buying opportunity and slow and steady, we are heading towards 19,000 marks in the Nifty index. Uh, if I look at the other data setup, India VIX is below 11 and PCR is near to 1.29. So, lower volatility, higher market base, and higher PCR indicate that momentum could continue. So, use any small decline as a buying opportunity with support of 18,666 and look for a rally to us 19,000 that is beyond the new lifetime high. Now talking about bank nifty index, uh, here also we have seen the open interest additions OI up by around 23% and uh, open interest is now near to 28 lakhs from beginning of 23 lakhs. So longs are also here but comparative sun under performance was in the bank nifty index. So we believe that momentum could continue and nifty has more potential to see the outperformance and continue the extension of this rally going forward. Now, looking at the stocks, I have selected three stocks from the different sector, but all are starting from I. So I will be the focus theme for the day, looking at the chart setup. So first is buy on Indian Hotel. This stock has been making higher to higher bottom on the weekly chart. It has given a consolidation breakout of last 10 days with decisive hold above 400. We have seen some short covering as open interest is down by around 12% in this month and open interest activity with put writing uh, stands indicating fresh uptick in the counter. So recommending to buy with the stop loss of 393 and Indian hotel can head to us 425 marks. Second trading idea mm -hmm. that is buy on IRCTC. So 25 weeks long consolidation breakout pole and flake pattern. So recommending to buy with the stop loss of 655. Stock has potential to rally to us 700. Last trading idea that is buy on FMCC. That is buy on ITC. The strongest counter in the entire FMCC and the sector is itself is strong. We have seen built up of long position, consolidation breakout of last 14 days indicate further uptick. So one can buy with stop loss of 444. Stock has potential to rally to us, 480 levels. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, that is the word coming in from Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Let's go across to our colleagues now to get a couple of stock ideas in. Vivek joins us now with today's Momentumizer stock of the day. Vivek, morning. What do you have? Well, good morning. You know, it's a stock that we don't discuss too often, you know, but it's been quietly making the moves, uh, especially last week. The stock in our radar is uh, Rain Industries. Now, remember, technically, when you're talking about the stock, the stock is now trading comfortably above all of the key DMA. So, 50, 100, and 200 DMA stock is trading above it. Uh, now, also, in the week gone by, the stock gained in all of the trading sessions and gained almost 9% in last week. And in fact, if you're looking at the company from the March 2020, uh, March 23 lows, stock is up almost 20% from the March lows. Now, talking about the company itself, remember the company's uh, subsidiary Rain Carbon is the second largest player as far as the CPC market, that is the calcine pet coke market is concerned. The company also is present in India in the cement business under the Priya brand name. Uh, now, remember, you know, this particular stock actually has a high correlation with you know, what can actually call the loosely translated peers, that is both HEG as well as graphite. Remember, both HEG and graphite have largely outperformance, uh, outperformed in the last couple of trading weeks. In fact, HEG was up almost 16% in the week gone by, graphite up 8%. So it will be interesting to see how Rain Industries, whether it can continue its outperformance uh, now from the last week's outperformance. Mm. All right. Uh, you know, Prakash is still uh, with us. Vivek, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Prakash, any thoughts? Uh, you know, these names, HEG, graphite, Rain, uh, as Vivek highlights, have uh, been movers and potentially one uh, follows what's happened to the other two. And just a quick comment on Manapuram. I think stock was up 4-5% on Friday. There is some relief from the Kerala High Court, which has come through. Uh, any thoughts at all? So, I think Manapuram is probably, uh, you know, too volatile. The events will keep on uh, uh, impacting the stock in the short term. But I think in the long term, it's, it's more of the growth story that you have to rely on. So, you know, for, for people who like that space, 
uh, these kind of dips, which are uh, 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 thanks to precipitation of some new flow, it's, it's probably a good way to get in. But uh, I, I, I am not a big fan of that space right now, given the competitive intensity from banks. So that's that's your call. But on on these coke uh, CPC and needle coke manufacturers, you know, I think very interestingly, the the uh, level of industrialization in the economy is now kind of percolating to the tier two, tier three, uh, you know, companies which are going to be benefiting. I mean, I spoke about why I was bullish about Tata Steel the other day. Uh, you know, while it might not seem like a very promising business uh, sector given the commodity, you know, tailwinds that we've seen. It is going to be quite favorable as we go along, uh, uh, you know, that some of these companies will benefit. But uh, the rain industry has a very different profile than the HEG uh, uh, Graphite India twins. Uh, there's one company which I just want to focus on, Prashant, before I uh, get off here, and that's uh, Mishra Datu Nigam. You know, we started speaking about defense, but uh, poor connectivity couldn't let me finish that. I think one of the spaces that will uh, rev up after this deal with the, with the G. Uh, HL, uh, this thing consortium is is going to be jet engines, and and these are probably the only guys who supply who are in a position to supply steel that goes into making those plates. So uh, keep a watch on that. The, mark, the 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 stock was quite smartened up uh, in in Friday's session, but I think there's a long way to go for uh, something like this. So uh, you know, iron and steel, yes, specialized yes, yes. Uh, you know, niche uh, segments and and a change in margin and pricing power is what you'll probably see in the next couple of years for uh, for more. So so be selective. Uh, mm. You know, uh, everything's not going to fly, and uh, I would I would go on to something which has very clear advantages. So it's a nice company, 4,000 crores, government owned. So you know, you have some of these good parameters also backing it up. So take sure. a look at that. Mishra Dhatu, right? Is what you're talking about? That's right. That's right. Midani okay, okay, is the, the short. Yes, yeah. Midani. Got it. It's uh, it's seen a rally of almost 70 percent in the last 12 months, but that really pales in comparison to the rally that other uh, defense stocks have seen. So perhaps some more upsides there. Thanks a lot, Prakash, for joining in. <coughs> well, let's focus on the auto sector now. If you look at the big winners this year, autos feature on that list. So you have Tata Motors, Bajaj Auto, Maruti that have all risen anywhere between 50 to 15 to 50 percent this year, as you can see on your screen. And last week was important because we had a lot of positive commentary come in both on the overall auto sector and on exports, which are picking up in a big way. Uh, so Ashok Leland told us that they are very confident of the CV cycle up move continuing for the next one year. SEAT said that their market share in the passenger vehicle space is expected to rise from 15% currently to 20% in the next three to four years. And the auto companies are very bullish on the export market. So SEAT is now targeting 25% of revenues to come from exports versus about 18% currently. And Ashok Leland said that exports will double uh, in FY24. Aniket Matre, who is the analyst at HDFC Securities, who tracks this entire space closely, joins in now to give us more details on that. Aniket, uh, once again, the focus is coming back on exports because of the resumption in most of these markets. But tell us, which are the biggest beneficiaries where the good news is not yet in the price? Sure. Hi, good morning, Sonia. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, so as far as exports are concerned, uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, players like uh, Bajaj Auto, TVS Motors, uh, uh, those are the guys who are the biggest beneficiaries because reasonable share of their top line comes from exports. And, and it has not yet played out for them for the simple reason that some of their key markets are yet to come back, right? Uh, if you look at Af Africa, it's not yet out of the woods. Uh, even some of the markets like uh, Middle East, uh, they are still... Uh, uh, not doing that well. Uh, if you uh, see, saw last week's news, uh, the Naira has depreciated almost 30% uh, plus, and that's not great news uh, for uh, exports retail demand, uh, given that inflationary pressure will continue to remain very high in those regions. So uh, these are the stocks where exports uptake has to yet play out. Uh, and once demand sort of normalizes, exports will come back for sure. Uh, but we will, uh, I mean, it, it's not going to happen in, in a quarter's time for sure. Okay, so exports will take some time to perhaps pick up again, Aniket, hi, morning. Uh, but just looking at the domestic market, I think what we saw in the month of May was extremely st strong sales trends across OEMs, uh, you know, for the domestic market at least. Uh, so what is, just looking at the price action as well, because, you know, you have to look at everything in context of where the stock already is. Yeah. Are sure. you better off playing two-wheelers now or let's say a stock like uh, Maruti or M&M on the four-wheeler side, does that offer enough opportunity as well? 
Right. So if you look at the auto space, will be uh, passenger vehicles have been doing uh, better, uh, right? In terms of uh, demand perspective, uh, order backlogs for players like Maruti and M M&M and both are very strong. M M&M and M has an order backlog of close to three lakh uh, thousand, and even Maruti has a similar order backlog at the moment with them. Uh, so players like these will continue to outperform uh, peers, uh, given that they have a very strong uh, mod- uh, launch pipeline uh, with them. Uh, you would uh, know uh, Maruti is. Uh, now uh, already launched the France and Germany. Uh, they they have already a good order backlog, and now they are talking about the Invicto launch in July. Uh, so uh, uh, strong order backlog for these companies will mean they will continue to outperform peers. Uh, coming to two wheelers, uh, clearly. Rural demand is not as out, well out of the woods. If you look at Hero Motor Corp, uh, they have grown just four percent in April plus May. Uh, so and and they have sort of underperformed the overall uh, other peers. Uh, so 100 cc category has still not come back clearly. Uh, 125 cc and above is still doing reasonably better off. Uh, and that's uh, where our topic in the two wheeler spaces. TVS Motors is what we like in uh, uh, two wheelers. Uh, if you look at commercial vehicles, uh, clearly demand momentum is seen to be decelerating uh, gradually uh, clearly over uh, as as the base has sort of normalized right last two years we have seen a very strong comeback from commercial vehicles uh, and uh, this year uh, most of the OEMs are expecting a single digit tour just about a 10 percent volume growth uh, in series which is what uh, uh, is uh, uh, we are also building in so uh, our sense is best of the CV cycle is behind us at the moment and hence we don't like the CV names uh, as, as as yet okay you don't like the CV names as yet got it uh, just coming back to that rural discussion for a bit, you know, we also heard from SkyMed that there is a deficit in the monsoons, especially in uh, the state of Maharashtra for the month of June. And you've recently downgraded Hero Motor Corp to a reduce from a buy. Is that your primary concern that the slowdown in the monsoon would sort of have the ripple effect on sales as well? Or is Hero in any case struggling because of competition and, you know, uh, inability to gain market share in certain segments? Thanks. So, uh, as far as this uh, predictions from SkyMet is concerned, clearly it's to be honest uh, too early for us to comment around a monsoon because we have seen monsoon sort of uh, uh, pick, uh, pick up with a lag and then sort of come back and a rural will come back if monsoon is normal. So a delay in monsoon may not be the critical factor at the moment unless of course there is a monsoon deficit overall which we will have to uh, uh, later uh, look at uh, things. We will continue to monitor that. That's not our primary concern on Hero for that matter. Our primary concern on Hero has been the fact that uh, the 100cc category has been underperforming and market motorcycle market seems to be shifting from away from its forte which is the 100cc to 125 and above. Uh, if you look at last three four years, uh, the 100cc category from a contribution of 58% has come down to 51% as of 523. And the 125 and above segment, or specifically talking about 125, it's gone up from 18% to 26% in the last four years. And Hero Motocop's market share in 125cc category has fallen from almost 50% plus to now 20% in FY23. So his inability to recover back share in a market which is growing, that is our primary concern in Hero Motocop. And uh, the second bigger concern clearly is the fact that Honda is now looking at launching product in the 100cc, which is uh, his uh, clear forte, right? Shine 100cc has been launched uh, in his uh, three big markets, uh, uh, northern market, uh, which is Rajasthan, UP, and Bihar. Uh, uh, and, and that can have a, a reasonable impact on Hero's numbers, sure, is what sure. we believe. So, yeah, so those are our primary concerns on Hero. Okay, all right. We'll have to, you know, let you go on that note. We're heading into the market opening, but appreciate your thoughts entirely. Thanks a lot, Aniket, for joining in. Let's quickly get some 910 calls going. Uh, Mitesh is back with us. Mitesh, what is the big call at 910? I'll go with the buy on m M&M and Finance. Uh, keep a stop at 297, targets of 320. And Sudarshan, what about you? Well, it's Tata Power with a stop under 218. Okay, all right, gentlemen. Thank you for the calls. Let's see how this plays out. Uh, well, we have a you know a couple of stocks to look at. Uh, let's get to Ekta first on uh, some of the prominent uh, brokerage notes. There's a note on NBFCs today. Ekta, do run us through it. Thanks for that. Well, yes, uh, definitely a lot of bullishness which is coming in for the NBFC space this morning. There are three brokerages which have written on it. I'll start with JP Morgan where they say there is a perennial boom-bust cycle of the NBFCs which is again recovering and may last for the next four to five years. 
both domestic as well as foreign investors suggest under allocation to this segment there is scope to add beta in portfolios via nbfc's bajaj finance lnt finance are their top picks ms has written morgan stanley in the large cap space uh, quality group the key picks are bajaj finance and spi caps manipuram and uh, pnb housing and shriram finance can give outsized returns according to them and outsized returns are likely in high in quality insurance names as well sbi life hdfc life and icici pro hsbc has also written on them a strong eps growth cycle continues nbfcs can continue to outperform they've upgraded uh, manipuram to uh, sorry mnm to uh, buy from whole target price is raised and they have a whole host of buys from the likes of bajaj finance to chola investment to lic to a couple of others this uh, list should come up for you all right thanks a lot it is on our screen thanks for that ekta well uh, jspl is the other stock that i'm looking at this morning kotak has upgraded jspl and uh, they have they say it's their top pick in the sector the stock is up almost 2.5% uh, right now they've raised their target price to 740 which is a big upside to the current market price and they say the next 12 months is a transformational period for the company where there are various projects that are coming in for commissioning in the next 12 months and their capacity would increase by 65% in the next two phases also uh, all right so we will of course uh, continue talking about jspl in a bit but here you go here's the first tick on the index looking pretty good and we are virtually at all time highs now i mean just about 20 30 points away from there the first tick is in the green uh, well within kissing distance of that all time high uh, so we'll keep our eyes peeled on that well uh, the mid cap index <laughs> Sorry, is the one that we got to within 6 points of it yeah. at the day side <laughs> <laughs> for... i think it's the mid cap index where the party continues right we just keep quibbling about the <laughs> the nifty but the mid cap yeah. index is up almost for half a percent very good opening really for the markets so dr reddy's is your big mover up about 1 and 1/2 percent ekta was telling us about the positive news for two of their facilities so that's the big mover on the index apollo hospitals not too far behind metals have come back in a big way in the last many days so tata steel is up about 7 tenths of a percent JSW Steel is a potent of a percent, and JSPL you just heard about the Kotak upgrade over there. Nifty, by the way, now just 26 points away from that all-time high, resuming that all-time high rather. So we're going to keep our eyes peeled for that. The advance decline ratio is well in favor of the advances, almost 1800 stocks there. On the downside, what's dragging is Hero Motor Corp. Um, there is that downgrade that has come in, uh, you know, from uh, Axis Securities. You just heard from them a while back. Apart from that the weakness in the monsoons is something that will impact some of these rural stocks so keep an eye out there HUL is also dragging a bit Reliance is uh, 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 in the back foot this morning Bharti Airtel as well not doing too much Indusin Bank NTPC a couple of other stocks that are in the red but given take everything this is a good opening this market is all set to hit those new highs whether we achieve them today in the next 1 hour 2 hours uh it doesn't really matter because we are virtually at those levels now i think sometimes you know when you stop looking at the board at that uh, countdown timer that's when things happen so uh who knows but anyway look at the strength of the mid cap market uh we are up up and away uh jspl the stock that uh, you know uh, sonia was just talking about on the back of the upgrade straight away 4.5% higher shriram finance a bunch of these nbfcs you've heard a lot of upgrades on the the nbfc pack today Shriram Finance uh, is up and about. I think there was supposed to be a block as well. Nimesh was alerting us about that, so we'll keep an eye out on it. Five Star Finance, where upgrades have come in. Kalyan Jewelers, there were blocks uh, on Friday where six percent equity moved around, and there's a you know further follow-on action on the stock today. It was up ten percent on Friday, another four four and a half percent today. Mishra Dhatu, the defence team is well and truly active, so five percent up on this one. Access Case is news. Uh, they have uh, I think completed a small acquisition, so five percent on that stock. So it's really, by the way, eighteen thousand eight seventy two. We need to get the timer back on, right? That board, eight seventy three, eight seventy one. It's practically there. Fourteen points, fifteen points. Uh, Mid cap market is saying, hey, you know what? Uh, we are having a big party and a big breakout of our own. So not really waiting on the mid cap screen. Uh, more names like NMDC Steel, Mannapuram, up and about. so it's looking good in terms of the uh, the watch list stocks that are uh, on the back of news flow moving on the back of news flow manapuram uh, 2.5% higher hal is 2% higher so these defense names like uh, paras defense mtar also fairly active as we start the day off so 74 73 74 prashant now it's uh, teasing just a couple of points away oh yeah it's uh, <clears throat> you know just a couple of points away 76 uh, and it'll come uh, so uh, you know <laughs> a matter of time
Now, uh, just a couple of other names uh, where we can uh, see where we are seeing some action. HAL, uh, for example, is there uh, right at the top of the list, gaining list. We put out new slow there as well. Uh, so stocks uh, up about two and a quarter percent, but huge volumes in it. Uh, there is JSPL, which is up about 4%. Uh, of course, the upgrade, as Sonia was highlighting. Kalyan Jewelers is another one. I think last week was a good one for Kalyan. Uh, and uh, that is up uh, 4%, 136. Uh, Sriram Finance, uh, we highlighted that. Manapuram is up about 2%, 128. Skipper uh, is another one, which is coming up with a 14% gain. And these are the kind of names uh, which pop out of... Nowhere in the mid cap broader market space, but huge volumes on Skipper for this time of the day, as you can see. Uh, now, there is Five Star, which is the Chennai based uh, NBFC, uh, you know, relatively newer listing in the market, 5% higher on that one, 631. Uh, there is uh, Borosil Renewables, which is coming up with a 7% gain. Uh, so, some new names, 570. There is Texmaco Rail, which is up uh, 3%. Uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So this is, you know, the broader market list, which is uh, looking very, very solid uh, right now. On the downside, DMART is down 1%. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's coming up uh, with volumes. Uh, so just highlighting it. Tata Communications is down about 1.5%, uh, 1604. And I think we've got Varun Beverages and PVR, which are down 1.6%. Uh, signed is another one, which is seeing some uh, profit booking as well. Uh, so just kind of, uh, you know, middling kind of activity on the downside, but enough and more on the upside. So, yeah, I just want to mention that this market is so secular in nature, right? I mean, if you look at the uh, list of gainers or the list of stocks at 52-week highs from the large caps, there are it's across the board. Mm. So something like a Titan is sitting at a fresh 52-week high, Dr. Reddy's is at a fresh 52-week high, ABB India, Cummins, PI Industries, Britannia, Chola Finance. So the list is pretty long and it's spread out. So this is a market that is starting to sort of spread out, not just to the frontliners, the mid-caps, but across sectors as well. I guess, you know, that basket buying, I think Nimesh was mentioning that on Friday in our Closing Bell show, about the basket buying from FIs across segments, and that's something that's perhaps playing out now. Well, uh, you know, it is buying, <laughs> basket or otherwise, <laughs> and uh, it is showing, isn't it? I mean, price is looking super, super strong. Price action. Gautam Trivedi is now joining us. He's co-founder and managing partner at Napier Capital. Gautam, good to have you with us here. I reckon it's possible that you join us when uh, we'll have to announce and the Nifty hits a new high. <laughs> so just <this> 10 <laughs> points or 15 points away. How are you feeling, uh, Gautam, right. about the market and uh, uh, your, your thoughts? I mean, uh, very strong rally, especially in mid caps and small caps. Yeah. I think uh, you're absolutely right. This is not just an India phenomenon. It's actually a global phenomenon. If you look at the Nikkei, uh, the DAX, both at uh, lifetime highs, uh, uh, the CAC in France is also uh, near a lifetime high. So I think you're seeing this as a global event. Uh, it's not happening and limited only to India. From an F, uh, I, uh, or FBI perspective, should I say, uh, we're at the fourth largest recipient of foreign flows year to date. So if you look at China, northbound flows, they've been $28 billion. Korea has been over $13 billion. Uh, Taiwan's $9 billion. And we're now about uh, just under $6 billion, I believe, in year to date uh, FI flows. So I think uh, having said that, I think the market still has legs to go. And the reason I say that is uh, the fact that when the market hit a premium, and I'm talking of MSCI India over MSCI Asia X Japan, uh, hit a premium of 96% is when actually the market actually took a huge tumble uh, late last year. And uh, that premium contracted to as low as 48% by mid-March, early April. So that's when the foreigners actually came back. And I believe that the premium now is roughly about 57, 58%. So I think there, there certainly is more foreign money that uh, India can certainly absorb across uh, large, mid and small caps. Uh, Gautam, hi, good morning. By the way, I just wanted hi. to make one mention on the market. Although we are, uh, you know, almost approaching all time highs, the Bank Nifty today is not really performing as much. Uh, it's absolutely flat at the moment. And there are some banks like Indusin Bank, ICICI Bank, SBI that are actually dragging the markets and preventing them, preventing the Nifty from getting to an all-time high. So just wanted to mention uh, that point as well. Nothing alarming, but just one data point. Uh, Gautam, where do you see market yeah. leadership now? Because, you know, this very interesting market. Sectors that haven't performed for years are coming back in a big way, whether it's autos, real estate, defense. Of course, defense now, it's been one, one and a half years of a rally. But uh, yeah. where do you see the next leaders come from? 
you know, the question really is that, is this uh, rally too narrow uh, for comfort? And frankly, if you look at the Nifty 50, uh, 10 stocks, the top 10 stocks have basically uh, accounted for more than 50% of the gain since mid-March when we hit, a, hit the low of the year. Similarly, if you look at the S&P 500, uh, literally uh, eight tech stocks that account now for 30% of the market cap of the S&P 500. And again, there it's been a pretty narrow rally. Question really is that is this uh, going to now expand to a broader rally? And I hope it does, because as you said, uh, uh, you named a few sectors that we've seen uh, uh, rally, uh, which hadn't really participated until recently. I think there is scope even now for maybe a real estate still on, uh, cement, uh, some degree of cap good still to go, because the, the bulk of the capex of the government in the budget uh, which itself is a record number, will start to kick in given the fact that we have a big election next year. And of course, a whole bunch of state elections uh, later this year. So I think uh, these are the three sectors that I would focus on um, as uh, hopefully continuing to participate in the ongoing rally. Uh, Gautam, hi. Good morning, Surabhi here. Hi. You know, I, I'm morning. a little surprised that, that you haven't found the rally broad enough because whether we're looking at uh, the month of June, and I was looking at data. So in June, yeah. the micro cap index is up 7.5%. This year, calendar year 23, that index, the micro cap index is up some 17%. Nifty's up 4-5%. Yeah. In June, the Nifty's up 2%. And actually, banks have been underperforming, right? You made the point earlier about foreign capital, and that's the narrative, that we, we should be getting more foreign capital. But then yeah. why are the, the big boys really underperforming, so to speak? And a lot of this money is chasing... Actually, mid caps, uh, small caps, and, and even micro caps. Do you see this continuing to be the defining trend over the next few months, or do you see that changing? You know, Surbi, that's a good point. But the fact is, uh, typically, foreign investors are not that kicked about small and micro caps. So a lot of that uh, definitely is retail or H and I led in India. Uh, you don't see too much foreign participation below maybe a two or one and a half to two billion dollars in terms of market cap. So I think uh, the FII money is clearly coming into the uh, larger caps. Uh, if you look at March, April, and May, the numbers that I have with me, uh, over $3 billion has come into financials. And uh, that's partly been funded by about $1.5 billion of selling in IT, which I think is an area to look at as well, because some of these stocks have had a massive correction. I mean, Infosys is, is an example. We do own the stock in our portfolio, but that stock's uh, uh, down more than 15%, uh, and it's been the worst performer in the IT pack, at least among the large cap IT stocks. So I think uh, the uh, rally will get broader. I'm, I'm confident of that happening. It's just that I think uh, foreigners typically don't participate in uh, small and micro cap. <clears throat> yeah, no, uh, got that point. Uh, Gautam, so... Uh... You know, at a, at a general broad level, Gautam, what are you doing? Are you uh, taking some uh, profits off uh, the table? Or are, you, are you investing more? Are you staying for <laughs> What are you doing? No, uh, we're definitely not taking money off the table at this point of time. I think we are still out there looking for stocks uh, that could potentially uh, participate in the rally or uh, have been laggards and, you know, uh, could, could uh, join the rally. I just got back from the U.S., uh, uh, for where I spent over a month meeting a whole bunch of uh, fund managers and asset allocators. And uh, believe it or not, the interest in two countries, uh, which was the highest, one was, of course, Japan, which is near the Nikkei is now at a 33-year high, and the second being India, which probably today will hit a new lifetime high. But uh, not even nine out of 10, but 10 out of 10 investors said they've been burnt in China and are super excited about putting incrementally more money into India. So I think uh, if, if that is indeed the mood, uh, and of course, a lot of these allocators made uh, visits to India in the first quarter of this calendar year. So I think hopefully a lot of that translates into money coming into uh, gem funds, India offshore funds, and that money uh, invariably will end up uh, getting finding its way into the Indian market. So if that happens, I think uh, this rally will continue. And at this point of time, we're certainly not in a mood to uh, book any uh, major profits. Okay. Uh, the space to be in lately has been metals, right? Uh, I mean, I just pull up the yeah. chart of JSPL. Uh, we were telling you about that earlier as to how Kotak has upgraded JSPL. And uh, Gautam, you know, the Kotak report makes this point that in the next 12 months, there are several projects that are coming up for uh, commissioning uh, for JSPL. Yeah. And their capacity is expected to increase by about 65 to 70% over the next two phases. 
Uh, is this a time to be betting on the metal names? If yes, is it the ferrous space you like, non-ferrous? I mean, which are the pockets that look good from a long-term horizon? Yeah, we're, we really don't invest in cyclicals. Uh, but my personal view on metals is that uh, a, a lot of that China reopening ended up being a bit of a, you know, hasn't really played out as, as well as people expected it to. And I, I'm not sure if the rally in metal stocks uh, uh, is really going to necessarily sustain. So that's my personal view on, on metals. Okay, got that. Uh, Gautam, great chatting you, with you as always. Thank you for joining in. Didn't Thank get you. the all-time high, but so what? I mean, I think it's, it's a market where the mood is pretty optimistic, and I guess that is really important from an uh, investor's perspective. By the way, the reason we're not getting to that all-time high, it is banks, like Sonia pointed out, but uh, today you don't have Reliance helping. You don't have something like a HUL helping. So you've got a little bit of a profit taking that's quite evident on the other side of the screen. The life insurers, remember this the huge rally that we had on Friday. Uh, life insurers are cooling off a little bit. Uh, so you, yeah, the, the red side has, has a fair amount on the, the other end, uh, countering for the greens. And therefore, you, you're pretty much uh, stuck in that range. Volatility, 10, 15, 20 points here and there. But yes, that momentum that the bulls would have hoped for, that you know, big push through, to the all-time highs, that's missing right now. Maybe it picks up in the next half hour. Who knows? It's a long, long day ahead. But let's keep the conversations flowing. Nilesh Shah, Managing Director at Kotak Mahindra Asset Management Company, is with us. Nilesh, good morning. Uh, great to have you on the show, as always. So I want to start not with when will the all-time high come or not, but I, I want to ask you, when you speak to all of your fund managers, do they still find a lot of comfort in this market? Are they still enthused with a lot of ideas, stocks available at at least reasonable prices, if not cheap prices? Or is stock selection getting difficult after what has been a breathtaking rally so far this financial year? So one, to some extent, my fund manager's job has become easier as investors have started behaving very, very maturely. When markets are cheap, let's say 17500 and below, we get SIP plus subscription. When markets are expensive, let's say 18,000 and above, we get SIP minus redemption. And last month, flows did come down, uh, keeping in mind that behavior. But notwithstanding what happens on the liability side, we have to focus on asset side. And over there, yes, it is a bit difficult to find value in this market. It's a fairly priced market, neutral market. And one will have to be careful in picking up stocks at this point of time. By and large, we are long-term investor. Our portfolio turnover is about 10, 15% a year. So we are not really looking to buy things with one year or two year view. We are looking to buy things with a longer term view. Nilesh, hi, good morning. It's a great time to be uh, chatting with you since the markets are at all time highs. The mood in general is good. Uh, but, you know, we were having this discussion on our show editor's roundtable and almost every expert agreed to the fact that uh, there is no euphoria in the market just yet, right? I mean, uh, plenty of stocks are still well off their 52-week highs. Do you feel the same that although the markets are at all-time highs, this euphoria from retail, this, you know, everybody jumping in because of the FOMO factor has not uh, culminated just yet? And if yes, could that mean that there is perhaps more upside to the market uh, despite all the triggers being priced in? So, Sonia, this might be a little bit of bragging, but take this in a lighter way. The euphoria about India today is now with the FPIs. They were on exodus mood between October 21 to June 22, selling about $35 billion. And now they are buying back the same stocks at a higher prices. So, undoubtedly, there is euphoria about India. But that's more on the foreign portfolio investors than local investors. The local investors have been buying equity on a regular basis. By and large, they have been coming via mutual funds right, rather than going directly into the market. By and large, they are focused on quality. So overall, retail investors have matured a lot. This is not to say that everything is hunky dabri in India, even today. 89% of retail investors who are going to trading in FNO end up on the losing side. So there are two India coexisting, one matured, experienced investors participating in long-term story, the other which is trying to trade in the market, gaining the experience that trading is generally injurious to your financial health. 
Mm. Nilesh, uh, I think you and I have spoken about, uh, I think over the last 15, uh, 17 years, uh, various points we've spoken about, you know, the fact that India's time has come, right? Uh, but this seems like one of those, and you're absolutely right. You look after publication after publication. Uh, in, in many ways, the stars seem to be uh, kind of uh, aligning. One factor, one new factor, uh, which I think was not present in the earlier occasions, was the absolute... Uh, maybe a strong word, but uh, you know, disgust people are, investors are uh, expressing towards the largest EM market, which is China, right? Uh, so that means that they're looking for uh, opportunities elsewhere, and that is a really big one. It could be a big structural factor if that stays that way. We have Prashant Khemka also joining us, founder at White Oak Capital. Uh, Prashant, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, what are you guys doing at White Oak uh, with uh, where the market is now? And how are you thinking about it, more importantly, directionally from here? No, certainly, a uh, very apt point that you noted about uh, China. Um, I think the leadership there for geopolitical priorities uh, has... Uh, uh, what that has meant is the po uh, economic policies have taken a back seat. And that is playing to an India's advantage when India is on the front foot uh, in terms of its economic policies. So these uh, confluence of events that have come together, uh, which includes you know, the fact that COVID and Russia, Ukraine is now business as usual. Uh, we are end of the global rate cycle. Um, and without a you know, massive fall off in economic activity in the world's largest economy that was anticipated, and this uh, largest EM market, as you pointed out, uh, competitively falling behind India, I would say in economic terms, has meant a big boost to uh, economic activity, particularly in the manufacturing sector, and resulted in uplift in both the corporate earnings expectation as well as the multiple for Indian equities compared to the EM um, equity multiples around the world. So we are in our EM portfolio, for example, India is the largest position at this time, um, ahead of even China. And within India portfolios, obviously, we are fully invested as always, uh, with largest exposure in sectors like uh, financials and consumption. Mm. Uh, Prashant, uh, you know, in your uh, now and in your earlier avatar as a uh, sort of global uh, manager, EM manager, uh, I was reading an article in uh, the Financial Times, which was uh, which talked about how investors are asking for ex-China EM structures. This is something we highlighted last year as well, but that ne now seems to be happening. I mean, just like you know, this Asia ex-Japan came into being some 30 years ago. Uh, now it is ex-Japan ex-China. I don't know. If that, I mean, if you're hearing anything, or, or or is the media making too much of it? Just wanted your thoughts, Prashant. Mm -hmm. No, very true. Now, we have to be careful because these things come and go. Uh, but yes, over the last 12 to 15 months in particular, the demand for China, uh, EMX China, or even Asia X China has certainly surged. We've had several inquiries, uh, several requests from uh, institutional investors in uh, Europe and elsewhere, whether we can uh, consider uh, having a tailor-made portfolio without China. Uh, I think... This is the peak of bipolarity, if you will, uh, that I have seen in my uh, 25 years uh, investing career uh, globally, where the negativity um, on China is at its highest and the positive sentiment towards India is at the same time very high. So this relative positive uh, attitude towards India compared to China, I would say, uh, is at its highest. And it manifests itself in several forms. One is this ex-China uh, uh, demand, but also the number of clients that we interact with uh, globally who uh, are for the first time looking at India as a separate standalone allocation. So many of the U.S. investors historically have had EM allocation and a China standalone allocation. But today, many of those clients are looking at India as a standalone allocation mm -hmm. and uh, are at advanced stages of discussions, not just with ourselves, but in the industry with uh, um, many managers and several of them moving their allocation from China to India. So both Absolutely. these...
are at their peak at this time. Absolutely, Prashant. I think, you know, this is a sense we've been picking up from a whole range of market experts, Indian and foreign overseas. I think the consensus is that uh, come, you know, late summer or fall, perhaps we should see, uh, you know, a big pickup in FBI flow. So let's, let's watch for that. But in the meantime, uh, Prashant, let me draw your attention to the micros, really. And you're someone who's seen so many different market cycles, right? So this mid-cap rally that started, it's only about two and a half, three months old. Uh, but already, if you look at the calendar year, then the micro-cap index is up 16%. The mid-cap index is up, you know, 13 14%. Nifty is only up 5% or 45 less than that. Now, my, my question is that uh, are you already noticing any pockets of, you know, small excesses building up? which could be red flags, which invest investors should really watch out for? Or do you think this is actually a very, very nascent, longer-term bull market, mid-cap bull market, and we should be prepared to see uh, euphoria, prepared to see very, very high multiples as, as well? How do we approach this side of the market? Certainly. I think we always have to be watchful, but uh, this time it doesn't seem like uh, it is out of place uh, compared to where the rest of the market is. Uh, remember, prior 12 months... Uh, if you see, uh, so as you rightly pointed out, this uh, uplift in mid and small and micro caps is largely two, three months old. If you look at uh, last year, 22, uh, these segments had underperformed large caps. Not by a huge lot, but they had underperformed nonetheless. So there's been some time correction in this area. And even if you look at longer term, especially over the last five year periods, it's not that these guys have the smaller or mid caps have substantially outperformed the large caps. Mm. So I'm not saying these guys undervalued particularly and should, uh, uh, you, you know, room to have a big rally because of valuation reasons. But yes, uh, the momentum may build up further. Uh, I don't think it's reached euphoric levels at this time. There are obviously certain political events in India, particularly the central election next year. And if that goes in line with market expectations, then it is possible post that, if this momentum continues mm. post that, sure. that might be some euphoria. Okay, so there's no euphoria yet in the market. Got that. Now we are, what, virtually about 40 points away from all-time high. So let me try and just, uh, you know, wrap up with uh, Nilesh Shah and his comments. Nilesh, um, what do retail investors do now? Uh, investors who have perhaps not uh, jumped onto this rally as early as they would have, uh, you know, uh, thought to. What is the best way to approach the market now? Do you uh, load on to uh, some of the sectors that have done well up until now? Do you find new leaders in this market? What's the best approach? Kudya, so, I'll simply say, do your SIP in mutual fund and participate in India growth story. It's never too late to start your journey in in in, in SIP in mutual Okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Nilesh, give us some more insights. You know, today. some 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 ideas. Maybe I, I know we can never discuss stocks with you, but I, I you know, as a house, Kotak has been extremely optimistic on the manufacturing space. I think you guys like cement a lot, for instance. But maybe some more specifics where you still think valuations are reasonable and one can build that uh, you know multi-year portfolio. So clearly, this is a market which is fairly priced. There will be volatility in the days to come, thanks to various events from Fed pivot to central election. My recommendation to investor is, you know, just build a diversified portfolio. If you are beginning, then a large cap portfolio is better. If you are a veteran, then double in small and mid cap also. <laughs> but maintain a disciplined asset allocation and regular investing. Every correction is a great opportunity to enter Indian growth story. Okay, got that. Prashant Khemka, uh, final question to you. Uh, markets at all-time highs, what do retail investors do and what's the best strategy to adopt for the next 12 to 18 months? As always, I would say stay fully invested. Uh, figure out for yourself what's a comfortable level. That may be different for every individual, but don't try and time the market come in and out because those are in the final reckoning uh, the people who are left behind who try and come in and out. I think as Nilesh Bhai at some point in time has uh, mentioned, the returns that investors get is a function of time in the market rather than timing the market. That's very, very aptly put. And if you think you are expert investor yourself in stock picking, indulge in that and enjoy that. But otherwise, the right advice as Nilesh Bhai gave, invest 
in a good mutual fund, ideally through SIP, so that you get time diversification as well. But regardless of how you invest, stay fully invested at all times would be what my suggestion would be. Okay, stay fully invested. That's some sane advice coming through. When markets are at all-time highs, you know, people start to get a bit jittery. But I guess uh, the optimism from both of you is flowing through. And thanks a lot for joining in, Prashant, Kimka, and Alesha. Appreciate your thoughts here on CNBC TV 18. Well, that's the word coming in on the market. Uh, Prashant Kimka saying India is their largest position in the emerging market portfolio. They're fully invested in India right now. And several investors are moving their allocations out of China and into India. Let's sip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, we will be joined by George Alexander Muthut, who's the managing director at Muthut Finance, to discuss the company's business outlook. Later, we'll also connect with Gangadi Madhuka Reddy, who's the MD and CEO at MedPlus Health Services, to discuss outlook on their business going forward. Welcome back with the markets at all-time highs. There are plenty of sectors that are at all-time highs as well and the sectors that are doing well. Muthut Finance is actually the first corporate on our radar today. The company's Q4 performance, especially in the gold business, was very strong. The assets under management have risen by 9% year-on-year, while the loan growth saw a nearly 10% rise sequentially. George Alexander Muthut, who is the managing director at Muthut Finance, joins us now uh, to talk more about that. Uh, George, thanks a lot for joining and always great speaking with you here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, you know, I wanted to understand, uh, the last time, of course, you told us that your core focus will continue to be in the gold market. Uh, but over there as well, competition has intensified. There is a little bit of pressure that uh, you have been facing in the recent past. So I just want to understand, how is the competitive landscape now in the gold loan segment? And what would this mean in terms of your, you know, growth, the AUMs, etc.? Uh, will it continue to be in double digits in FY24? And what's the outlook? Good morning. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, the outlook for gold loan is quite good. We had said that uh, we would be growing well this year. Last quarter has been good, and this quarter is also equally good. We are happy that the, the sector is growing. Gold loan business for Muthur is also growing. Last time we had been saying that uh, for Muthur Finance, the focus, the primary focus is always gold loan, and it will continue to be a focus going forward also. So we had uh, last year, in the last conversations, uh, we had suggested or we had indicated a growth of 15% in the gold loan AUM. I think we should hold by that because as the trend in the last quarter and this quarter we see is that we may be able to, or we will be quite comfortably be able to do the 15% growth in the gold loan AUM this year. Mr. Mutu, Next, we also want to know about the uh, competitive landscape, yes, quite a few players have actually started entering into this market. The mm. NB, few NBFCs have come into the market and uh, some of them have started started giving gold loan also. But then mm. in, from the what previous experience or uh, experience they have with others also, other NBFCs also joining the gold loan, I think I feel that after a while, uh, fatigue steps in. Fatigue will start coming in, and uh, these gold loan, these NBFCs will move their focus from gold loan to something else. That's what I have seen earlier. As regards the banks, especially the PSU banks, and all the banks which had quite a lot of uh, what should we say bad loans, sticky loans in the big corporate sector, have now turned their attention to gold loan, and the last three, four quarters, most of them 
have been doing good work. Of course, they have a big branch network. Right. In, in banks have about 60,000 plus branches all over India. And a few of, quite a few of them are giving gold loans also. But then by the banks giving the gold loans, the market is deepening. More and more people are getting, customers are getting into the gold loan bandwagon. That means they are getting more comfortable to do gold loans. Gold loan is actually a very smart way of taking a loan. And yeah. people are realizing that. The market is also increasing. So Absolutely. although competition is coming, yeah. we, as from our side, have not seen any dip in our growth. And as I said earlier, we will be able to do the 15% plus growth in the gold loan sector this year. All right. Mr. Muthu, that's a very comprehensive uh, response. Uh, so, uh, actually, there was a bit of a dip earlier, but the dip was reversed. Fourth quarter was very good. And uh, that 15% growth, I mean, we spoke with you about a month ago, and that 15% uh, growth is reassuring uh, to the market. Investors have taken note. Your stock started to... Uh, uh, repair some of the damage it has seen. Uh, so, uh, actually, NBFCs and banks entering the space is, in a way, yesterday's story, right? The, the, the new news story is competitive intensity coming down, what you've been telling us in the last two or three interactions uh, that we've had with you. Is that correct, sir? Yes, I, I stand by it uh, because the competitive intensity is coming down because we, uh, the NBFCs and banks are also looking elsewhere for their growth, not the gold loan. It was good at, uh, earlier, but now they are also realizing that it is not that easy also. It's a very quite a few process-oriented and uh, operationally uh, challenging business also. So I think after a while, they will reduce their focus. But I'm sure even with their they are continuing to do this, we should continue to grow our work. Mm, okay. So, Mr. Muthud, I guess uh, you've made it very clear you're expecting 15% growth in your gold loan business this year and you're not too uh, perturbed with this competitive intensity. So then let's talk about some of the other business internals. Uh, we seem to be in a, in a long pause kind of a situation with, resp with respect to the central bank, though the RBI keeps saying this is just a pause, it's not a pivot. Uh, but what is your outlook on the cost of funding? In the fourth quarter, margins tapered off a little bit. I mean, you know, you were down to just below, I think, 12%. What is the outlook? I think uh, the cost of funding, the cost of incremental borrowing, I think it is stabilizing. It is not going up any further. In the last one year, it has gone up by about 100 basis points. But uh, gold loan being such retail loans, we were uh, able to maybe uh, pass it on to our borrowers. Because borrowers also, when they borrow from elsewhere, whether it is a gold loan or any other loan, mm. they have started paying higher rates. So when they have started paying higher rates in other loans, they wouldn't mind paying a higher rate in gold loan. So we have been able to pass on that. Uh, coming to our margins, our <laughs> spread, we would like to keep it between 10 and 11. I think going forward also, we should be able to maintain the spread of 10 to 11 percent on our gold loan. Okay, that's on the gold loan side. We've talked about that at length. Tell us a little bit about the non-gold loan portfolio as well. Uh, Mr. Muthut, what kind of growth are you seeing there? And in terms of asset quality too, how is that shaping up? for FY24? Yeah, uh, as far as the other loan books is concerned, uh, we had uh, gone into the affordable housing sector and we also had a pause in the last two years because we were not growing that book well. But now that we have a new CEO also coming in the last four months, we are seeing growth in the last quarter. We have seen good growth in the affordable sector, affordable home loan sector, and we should see good growth going forward also. We expect the uh, affordable housing finance uh, portfolio is about 1,200, 1,300 today. We should see it reaching 1,800, 1,900 in the, by the end of the year. The other uh, loan gold loan portfolios were the salaried personal loan, which we started. Uh, we have about a 600 crores uh, portfolio there. We should see it reaching to about 1,000 crores by the end of the year. The microfinance, which is done by our subsidiary, Wellstar, uh, the microfinance sector has been doing well. And among the other peers in the market, the microfinance sector of Muthut is also growing well. They have about 6,000 crores of portfolio, and surely by end of the year, they should also reach about 8,000 to 8,500 crores. So the other portfolios are also growing. Uh, we recently started a, a very uh, fast uh, personal loan 
uh, to our gold loan customers also, very small portfolio, but then that is also being offered to our gold loan customers who have a good track record and who are willing to pay the EMIs. Today, the gold loan, what we give is all bullet loans, so those who are interested, they can take the EMI loan as a quick personal loan. Got it, Mr. Muthud. It's a pleasure as always, sir. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, running us through uh, all of that detail. Directionally, uh, you know, looking good. And uh, that's what markets want to hear. Thank you very much uh, for your time here on CNBC TV 18. Well, let's uh, talk about another interesting company. MedPlus Health Services is the company on our radar. Uh, the company is on an expansion spree in F523. They added a total of 1,074 stores. Uh, with respect to online uh, <coughs> stores, companies say that they continue to expand coverage of PIN codes for uh, orders online. Uh, the stock's done well. I mean, you know, late last year, stock was at about 600. It's come up to 800 now. Uh, Gangadi uh, Madhukar Reddy is Managing Director and CEO at MedPlus Health Services, and he's joining us right now to discuss uh, how business is doing. Uh, Mr. Reddy, good to have you with us here. Good morning. Thanks very much, Prashant, this side. I want to just start with, uh, and we, we have your sort of F524 guidance numbers, revenue guidance numbers. I think you uh, were guiding for flat margins, 20-25% uh, growth in top line and flat margins uh, for the full year in F524. But with just 15 days for the first quarter left, could you tell us how is discounting uh, looking like? I mean, is the pace of discounting coming off? I'm talking about online. Uh, what's the picture, if you can tell us? Uh <clears throat> Yeah, you know, one would expect that with the problems being faced by a bunch of the online guys, uh, that the discounts would actually come down. But unfortunately, it is not really true. Uh, we have at least one major competitor who is continuing to advertise and continue to advertise the big discounts and all. So while, um, you know, one of them, Pharmacy, has come off a little bit, I don't think the intensity has really come down that much. Um, I, so that's all I can say, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think all the journalists have been talking about the funding issues of most of these companies and the fact that, you know, all of them have been talking about reducing the discounts. But in reality, that has not really happened, Prashant. So what, what does it mean for MedPlus, sir? I mean, in that scenario, I mean, one is backed off. You're saying one competitor still persists. So mm -hmm. where are you at in terms of discounting and sort of, uh, you know, uh, being competitive, really? No, for, for us, we have always been the price leaders out there. You know, most of the online people have actually given discounts of 25% or so on the first three purchases or on some special occasions. And then they try to actually drop the discount to 15 or 16, which is a viable number for most of them. So mm -hmm. for us, though, we have always maintained the 20% discount on all bills above 1,000 and 10% below 1,000. <laughs> and that's continued. So as far as a customer is concerned, if we were to strictly look at it, uh, after the first three purchases in any online platform, we would be the most competitive ones. But most people, what they end up doing is after they do the first three or first two purchases on their own phone, they end up, you know, going to their spouses or children or someone else's phone. And so they oh. exhaust that full thing in their family before they actually start thinking about someone else. And unfortunately, in the past, what has happened is by the time a person exhausts this, you know, some other competitor comes in and says, OK, I, I also want to give the 25 percent discount. Sure. So. That that thing has been kind of perennial, honestly. So, you know, uh, Mr. Reddy, I think the reason why Prashant has asked you about this discounting and how the intensity has gone up, etc., is because if you look at your own business as well, right? I mean, your margins for the last 8 to 10 quarters have been in that exact same range of about 6 to at best 7%. It hasn't gone beyond that. And now with this discounting going up, with this intensity, competitive intensity rising, the fear is that perhaps margins could continue to either be in that range or maybe even fall further. Uh, is that uh, a legitimate concern? And if not, what would the margin band look like, uh, say, in the next one to two years? Okay. So, uh, our thing is a function of the rapid growth which we have. You know, we have been adding at the rate of, you know, 1,000 stores. We added 1,074 stores last year on a base of roughly around 2,700 stores. So, roughly around 35% odd stores, right? So, given that these all these stores will take a little while to actually mature, that's been a drag on us. And given that we had actually added 750 even the year before, and that was also a 30-35% growth on the base, you actually did not see any improvement in the margins out there over the last two years. But And again, as an as a extension of that, the fact that 50% uh, of our stores are under two years, 
and two and post two years is when we actually make the actual you know ebitda we are all we are going to be seeing this for a while this year also we are looking to actually add anywhere between 800 to 1000 stores and um, so you can expect it to be a flattish kind of thing as far as the normal business goes but you know as we continue to add sales on top of the 4500 crores i do not expect that our other costs which would be let's say you know we would start getting some benefits of scale my warehousing costs will not go up in the same level then neither will my corporate costs so we will see some benefit out there as we go forward uh, but the drag because of my new stores is going to be there the while online and the other discounting has affected us a little bit it's not done so majorly because you know end of the day most the complete online thing is actually less than 2 or 3% of the overall country at this point of time so honestly mm. Uh, while it does take off a little bit of shine of our SSG, it is not a major fact. Okay, uh, Mr. Reddy, just uh, I've been hearing you make a lot of very interesting points. Just to, to wrap it up first before I move on to the question, you're saying expect flattish trends on margins this year because of the you know this uh, huge impetus of new store opening. So we should expect margins to average out, uh, average out around the six percent mark for FI24. Uh, maybe slightly better, you could say, mainly because uh, we will definitely see some scale benefits. Uh, okay. But, yeah, th that would be the general trend. Uh, maybe, um, just slightly northwards of 6%. Okay, so uh, just a question on how you're funding this very robust store expansion. You had pretty solid operating ca cash flows in the fourth quarter. So what is the total quantum of cash on the books right now? What's the CapEx plan? Uh, would you be borrowing? Uh, just, just a you know, uh, debt equity profile as well, if we can get that. Sure. See, we raised 600 crores in the IPO, and that is primarily to grow stores. Mm -hmm. uh, it costs us around 30 lakhs a store, so which would basically mean, you know, uh, the last 1,074 stores would have basically taken us around 300 crores odd. So we have 285 crores in the bank. There is no debt at all in the company. Uh, this is more than enough for us to actually grow the current lot of stores. And by the time we are done with this, we our internal accruals and all should basically kick in for us to start growing at the rate of 1,000 stores a year. Even even if it is not, you know, we do would not mind borrowing a little bit on the working capital side. You know, my thirty lakhs per store cost is mainly working capital. Twenty lakhs of it goes towards inventory. Two to three lakhs goes towards the rental advance, and seven to eight lakhs only goes towards the uh, actual build out. So, which means the ten lakhs portion, which is the actual capex, that we have more than enough, you know, accruals to take care of a thousand store expansion. If there's a slight shortfall in the working capital, we'll borrow it, given that we don't have any debt at all right now. Mr. Reddy, just one final question. This private label sales are currently around 14% of your sales. How much do you right. think it could contribute to your overall business, say, two to three years down the line? Because okay. there's two components to it. One is 8%, which is medicines, which are actually the big margin drivers for us. The other <laughs> is you know, general, uh, surgical and rehabilitation kits and all, and the uh, hair care, skin care kind of stuff. Those we actually expect to go really rapidly. That five or six percent portion, which is non-medicine, I can fully see it going to ten or twelve percent or so you know, as we go forward. But the the medicines, though, will probably just move a little bit. You know, probably go from eight to nine or ten percent at the most. All right, uh, Mr. Reddy, we'll leave it there, sir. Out of time, but uh, good conversation as always. Good luck, sir, and uh, hope to speak with you again soon. Thanks indeed. Thank well, the market is in the red, uh, <laughs> one point, one and a half odd point. And, uh, you know, the 18,825 is where we are at. It's been a steady, it's just been, I mean, what, 45 minutes of trade, uh, but it's all been slowly uh, coming off on the Nifty. Let's just look at the Nifty Bank as well. Maybe take a look at where we are at. We are in the red on the Nifty Bank as well. A slow drop off, gentle drop off. Uh, the mid cap and small cap indices, I reckon, are doing much better because the market breadth is looking up. About 0.6% on the mid-cap index. Uh, and I think we've got the small-cap index up three-quarters of a percent. Uh, and uh, it's pretty solid uh, market breadth, with, uh, which is about uh, two and a half is to one. Uh, stocks gaining uh, to losing ratio. We'll take a quick break here. Mitesh will be with us uh, with uh, what to do in terms of the index and specific stocks. Uh, and, of course, uh, our research team comes back and uh, puts the spotlight on more stocks in a bit as well. Stay with us.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, the Nifty is down about, what, six points or so. 18, 820 is where we are at almost unchanged from last Friday. Mitesh is back with us. Mitesh, hi, good morning. Uh, just a quick view on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the index, which has lost a bit of steam, and uh, what would you do now? on the index, you know, I used to maintain that outlook that we are not uh, seeing any kind of strong momentum. In fact, it remains a market which is you know, kind of slowing down and therefore we might not uh, be very inclined to trade on the index. But trading with, uh, with uh, stocks as, uh, you know, uh, proxy on the long side for the index, I think is a good idea. The breadth, the mid-cap index remains stronger and I think that's where we should focus upon. I have a buy on BHL with the stock at 87 for targets of 92. And a buy on Bank of Baroda. Here I would recommend buying the stop at about 188 for targets of 200. Mm. All right. Uh, that's on BHL. It's up, by the way, 2.5% two, uh, two at this point in time. A couple of other stocks that are buzzing at the moment is MRPL, which is up almost 5%. And big movers coming in the uh, broader markets. Mishra Dhatu is now up almost 8%. The new listing, Ikio Lighting, is up almost 8% as well. And something like an aircon is up about 3, 3.5%. Three so lots moving in the broader markets as well. But let's get uh, some focus in on the commodity space. We have Manisha Gupta joining in now. Uh, Manisha, what's the buzz there? Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, I'm looking at uh, crude oil prices. By the way, all the commodities, industrial commodities, that is, whether it's metals, ferrous and non-ferrous, rubber and crude oil prices, have opened slightly on the weaker night, weaker time in the Asian markets right now. The crude oil prices opened a percentage point down, but clearly we seem to be getting more deeper cuts at this point in time right now. Last week was a good one. You saw 2.5% of gains come in for the crude oil prices. That is because the dollar index was on the weaker side, which still continues to be. We are still trading around that 102 level here. But the pressure comes in because major banks have downgraded China GDP forecast for the rest of this year for the next couple of quarters and that's weighing on to the markets. Apart from that, it also is about the Iran crude exports which have hit a new high in 2023. There are reports on how Iran and US, the Western world that is in conversation and if that goes through well then we could be looking at higher continuous uh, exports coming in from Iran as well. The other thing to watch out for in the markets uh, is going to be the money managers, the speculative money that is. The CFTC data shows that the net long contracts have been cut by 13,000 contracts there and that seems to be weighing on to the market. The crude oil prices, the reason that we're trading at around $75 a barrel is because there have been a lot of supportive factors as well. One, there is voluntary output cut from the OPEC and allies. There also is China refining which has surged to second highest on record for the month of May. June is expected to be on the positive side. And then US has reported seventh weekly decline in the number of operating rigs and oil counts there. The U.S. gasoline demand also is expected to be quite strong going forward at 9.24 million barrels per day. This is highest since December 2021. And then Russia Energy Minister said that the realistic price for crude oil is $80 a barrel going forward. Russia clearly has been making those kind of statements for the last couple of weeks there. The markets in the meanwhile will watch out for the Bank of England monetary policy that happens in this week. You also have the U.S. Fed Chair Powell testimony happening in this week. And then apart from that, China is expected to cut its key prime lending roads on Tuesday. So that's yet another three important key things that the street is taking cues from. Okay, Manisha, absolutely. We'll watch out for that. Yes, China has already kicked off some of those rate cuts. Let's see we, if we get more of that later this week. Uh, now we have, I think, Surabhi joining in because we're looking at a couple of these stocks that are reacting very well to some brokerage uh, notes and commentary. Five Star Business Finance is one such name. Uh, Surabhi is joining in. Surabhi, so many notes today. I forgot which brokerage has a note on this one out, but I remember the commentary was exceptionally positive as one of the fastest growing NBFCs. That's right. So, Nomura has written on 5 Star Finance. They have initiated coverage with a buy rating and a target price of 750. They said that it is a highly profitable and amongst the fastest growing NBFC in a very niche market. They estimate the company to deliver a 30% AUM compounded growth in the next three financial years, that is from FI23 to FI26. They think it will be driven by untapped opportunity in the MSC, MSME market, especially in the niche small size business loans, which is less than 10 lakh rupees. They see continuous expansion, uh, another growth lever with, with 50 to 60 new branches every year. So uh, niche um, uh, expansion in a niche segment and continuous expansion, both these two drivers for five star business. All right. Thanks a lot uh, for that. So that's on five star business. But Sriram Finance is the other one that we're looking at this morning. Nimesh is here uh, to give us more details on that. Nimesh, over to you. Hi, sir. So the stock is buzzing in trade of 5% after a large block. Uh, so 2.6% equity has changed hands in Sriram Finance. And I understand from sources that uh, TPG was a seller in today's block. 
some large funds were were, buyer, uh, were buyers as well. So the disclosures could be important, but uh, looks like TPG has cleaned out, has has sold out its entire stake in Shrinam Finance today. The other important thing to watch would be uh, going forward. Uh, the other large holder is Piramal Enterprises. They own 8.3 percent stake in in, in Shrinam Finance. So that potential could be the next seller uh, as and when that happens. So that's something to track. But because of the large block and and it was and did happen in the pre-open. So I've seen a bit of a reaction into this trade. In fact, uh, just uh, 10 days back, the management was on our channel and they sounded quite confident about the business as well. So they spoke about 10% growth to continue with FY24 as well. Uh, they expect 10 to 12% growth in the two-wheeler segment and 10 to 15% uh, growth in the farm equipment segment. So a lot of the levers are in place for the company to do well. That's the management comment. But uh, today's uh, uh, you know, rally is largely because TPG is cleaned out and they've sold their entire 2.6% in Shriram Finance today. Okay, Nimesh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our special segment, it's the economy coming up. Lata will get chatting with Debashish Mishra of Deloitte India and Anubhuti Sahai of Standard Chartered Bank to talk about India's trade deficit in May, which is the highest since December 2022. Stay tuned. Welcome to It's the Economy. India's May trade data had some elements of concern. Firstly, uh, the services exports data will come up for you. They have been firing away for the past year, but they have shown a distinct slowdown in May. Uh, actually, at 25 billion uh, services exports in May, they are a good 15% less than the average from January to April. The second point of concern, India's goods imports in May came in at over $57 billion, and that is nearly 9% higher than the average from Jan to April. Now, put the two together, slow falling services exports, rising goods imports. The result is India's trade deficit in May is the highest since December. And if you take goods and services, because services is a surplus, the deficit is still at $10.35 billion in May, which is the highest since November 2022. Now, is this a matter of worry? We have two experts with us, Debashish Mishra of Deloitte. He specializes in the flow of services exports. Deloitte itself has a large outsourcing unit. And in a minute, we are going to be joined by Anubhuti Sahai, the economist from Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, Debashish, first, good morning to you. Uh, you know, you're, uh, Deloitte itself services a lot of uh, external clients. And there are a lot of GCCs being set up. Why this 
downcast number, 25 billion, like I pointed out, it's a good 15% less than the average from Jan to April. Good morning, Lata, and thanks for having me over. Uh, you're right, you know, there are, we are seeing a uh, softening of demand uh, in certain segments. And as you can see from uh, commentary from large uh, tech providers also, particularly we are seeing uh, there is a softening of demand and clients are being cautious in the BFSI segment. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell that, you know, there, is, there, is, there also there is a distinction being made, uh, whether you are talking about run the bank or change the bank. If you are talking about the run the bank segment of it, demand is still flowing and that's the base uh, demand which will continue to flow. Where there are transformation projects like change the bank, their clients are being a bit cautious because you know, you know that you know better the Fed and ECB rate hikes are still continuing and there's been some failures of some banking institutions. So there's been a bit of cautious uh, in terms of clients in that segment. But there are other segments like uh, pharma life sciences. You have, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the, those consumer is neutral. So those other industries are neutral. As I mentioned that, you know, there is softening of demand in the BFSI segment. No, I take your point when you say that run the bank kind of services are continuing, which means run of the mill kind of services, but transformational software is not coming. But, you know, Debashish, when we last spoke, we were not talking about software at all. It is non-software exports uh, of India that suddenly saw a surge in the last couple of years. Uh, we have been doing audit, tax, compliance, uh, AI, a whole host of middle offices have gotten exported to India. Uh, simply because labor was expensive abroad, probably, or, uh, you know, India has uh, simply more chartered accountants and lawyers than anyone else. Do you think that trend has slackened a bit as, uh, you know, the wage inflation probably has lessened in the West? Not at all. I don't see that trend happening. And that's a more secular trend. And uh, you are right that, you know, when we last spoke, we spoke about non-IT uh, services exports growing. And uh, we believe that that trend will continue. We believe that, you know, more and more GCCs will continue to come into India and the existing ones would expand their range of services. Also, what you are also seeing is non-English speaking countries like Japan and others are also large companies are expanding what we had seen from English speaking OECD really focusing on the GCCs. Now that's expanding to non-English speaking countries like Japan and Germany. Okay. So that segment we don't see. In fact, that will continue to uh, expand and Interestingly, okay. uh, since we last spoke, Deloitte has opened three offices in okay. Pune, uh, Calcutta, and Chennai, and expanding okay. our workforce. So obviously, we see that you know that that trend is a more medium to long term trend, and that demand will continue to flow in. Okay, I can't argue with a man who has put his money where his mouth is. I mean, your company. So uh, no danger to non-software services exports. It is only software services which probably have slowed because of, uh, uh, you know, the slowdown in the BFSI space in the West. Uh, Anubhuti, uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Would you largely concur with Debashish? I mean, this fall in software, uh, fall in services exports uh, in May stands out. Do you think this could be a secular trend? I think, Lata, uh, the kind of numbers which we saw for uh, services exports, uh, especially, you know, like a $14 billion of services exports in one single month, uh, those numbers did look unsustainable. Uh, uh, can we go further lower? I mean, Debashish would be a better uh, uh, person to comment on it. But our sense is uh, that... Uh, Probably uh, we should stabilize between, uh, you, know, you know, like 11 and a half to 12 billion dollars on a monthly basis uh, for total services exports going uh, forward. You're talking net, there, uh, that is gross minus yes. the service imports. Okay. Yes, I'm talking about the net number. So are we are... Uh, uh, we have built in a $12 billion of services exports mm -hmm. uh, for remainder of uh, FY24. Uh, uh, as mentioned, there can be some softening in uh, software uh, exports, but of course there is this uh, strong support which is coming from the non-software non segment. Okay. And even if you look at the company guidance, uh, mm -hmm. everyone is talking about consolidation. No one is talking about a contraction. 
And the okay. last year's average is uh, pretty high. So our sense is $12 billion on a monthly basis is still uh, feasible when we are looking at it uh, from the balance of payment perspective. No, I take your point on that, uh, that uh, $12 billion perhaps uh, will be sustainable. But last year, we saw a month-on-month -month increase in services exports. So, you know, they were able to match the goods deficit. Now, for the next question, Anubhuti, and that's more important, we may be striking a higher goods deficit, isn't it? Look at the very strong uh, uh, imports, goods imports that we saw. And again, the math will come, goods imports... Uh, uh, in May at 57 billion were about 8-9% higher than the average from Jan to April. So isn't that a worry that uh, we are going to run up a higher goods deficit? Uh, so again here we'll take a step back. The question is, um, you know, in our point of view, the April uh, trade deficit of 15 billion dollars was unsustainable and May's $22 billion of trade deficit, in our view, is again unsustainable. And I'll uh, say, well, you know, I, I, there is a reason why we say so. $15 billion of trade deficit on a monthly basis is comparable to what we used to have pre-pandemic. Commodity yeah. prices are much higher. India is doing much better in terms of growth terms. So having such a low uh, trade deficit didn't make sense to us even back then. $22 billion of deficit, or what you're talking about, $57 billion of imports. Mm. You know, those kind of import numbers were last seen uh, in the middle of 22 when we were... Uh, uh, we were in the episode of very elevated commodity prices. Exactly. Prices have come down significantly. So our sense is this number also looks unsustainable. We will come off. Uh, we are definitely not going back to $15, $16 billion kind of a trade goods deficit on a monthly basis for the rest of the year. Our sense is we are likely to average closer to $19 billion. And bulk of the correction, in our view, will probably come from the non-oil, non-gold uh, deficit, which probably increased a lot in May uh, as we imported a lot more. Commodity prices okay. were comforting, so probably we imported a lot more, whether it was coal or chemicals, which led to this uh, surge. And yeah. maybe because we imported very less in uh, April, and, th and that there is was the a point. demand. That is the point. You know, commodity prices were not high in May. Uh, yeah. It is the volume that has gone up. Chemicals went up. Machinery exports have gone up. Uh, significantly, and as you point out, coal, so non-metallic metals, uh, uh, chemicals, all this indicates an industrial growth in India, which is very good. And like I guess we discussed with you as well, the industrial output, IIP numbers for April also, I mean, the average I got was one and a half or uh, thereabouts, and we ended up with a four and a quarter uh, percentage growth in IIP. So Indian manufacturing, Indian industry appears to be firing very well, Whereas the world is slowing, which is why our exports appear to be stagnating while imports are surging. Can't this not lead to a 22 billion trade deficit month after month? I don't think so, uh, Lata. And I'll, you know, like I'll probably we just need to look at it uh, uh, item by item. Uh, so coal prices, we all know probably were lesser vis-a-vis -vis the past few months. Yes. So it was a volume-led uh, increase. Increase. If you look at, uh, you know, the coal, we spoke to a lot of uh, uh, experts who are in this uh, space, and, uh, you know, there's no as such a shortage. There were few, uh, uh, you know, a few power uh, generating plants where there was some shortage, but otherwise, okay. in general, there is, it, it, is, it looks like, okay, so probably there was some stocking up impact okay. uh, there. Machinery, what you highlighted, uh, we have seen in the past too that it's slightly a volatile component. Uh, there are a few months where we see some lumpy demand uh, okay. pushing up the import uh, volumes and therefore the import value, but then it kind of uh, smoothen uh, out. So our sense is uh, if this jump up in volume demand was one off, say for instance like coal, or it was Both. compensating for very low volume uh, imported in the month of April, then it should smoothen out in the remainder of the year. Okay. Let me uh, make it very clear. We don't think we will see an average trade uh, deficit, uh, you know, like an average trade deficit of $17 billion, which was the case from Jan to April. That was a very low. Our sense is we will settle closer to $19 billion, $19, $19.5 billion uh, for remainder of the year, uh, given where commodity prices are, and given our view that we will also see some moderation in domestic demand as we move further into fiscal year 24. Okay. 
So you are betting that uh, the rise in uh, 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 interest rates will perhaps mellow Indian growth uh, or maybe the El Nino will and therefore we perhaps will not be importing so much. Uh, but uh, uh, Debashish, uh, any numbers you want to add in terms of what you are expecting in by way of services uh, uh, exports? Uh, you know, uh, the import deficit could still be there. We don't know. Goods, uh, goods deficit could still rise. But uh, how confident are you of services exports? Say, uh, what is your monthly run rate expectation or the annual run rate? We don't uh, track these numbers, but you know what I can tell you is that uh, clients are uh, obviously cons during these kind of times also consolidating a lot of uh, vendor contracts. Also, they are trying to be very innovative, asking asking suppliers to have you know more skin in the game by having value billing, having BOT kind of contracts. So obviously, you know, the Indian service providers are also pretty cutting edge in that sense in the mm -hmm. services exports market. So what I don't see that, you know, there will be a, a slowdown in that segment. Some segments okay. will definitely compensate for the sectoral slowdown in some, certain other segments. Like we are seeing that, you know, energy and resources, there is absolutely no slowdown and transformation projects are also happening. As I mentioned, life science, it, it, it is happening. Probably the rate of growth, what we had seen in FI23, that was unsustainable. That okay. created a base, but that demonstrated also the realm of possibility in terms of what all can be exported other than uh, technology services. Okay. So that, uh, to my view, uh, the, the rate of growth may moderate, but definitely okay. it will be much better than the, uh, you know, the okay. goods uh, mercantile exports. So. Okay. Yeah, just a final question to Anubhuti. Even assuming that we are running up a, a you know a annual deficit of twelve billion, a, a monthly deficit of twelve billion, goods and services included, and even assume it goes to say thirteen or fourteen, is that a worry? We uh, uh, we seem to be doing very well on capital flows, right? Yes. So, I, uh, so, you know, like just the starting point here is that I think 12 billion is a very high number uh, for okay. uh, soft uh, for services and goods put together. Probably okay. we will, you know, the worst case I would say is, is 10 billion dollars. Uh, we our base case is 7 billion dollars. Now, will it be an issue? Uh, uh, one big difference between 2023 and 2022 is the revival in uh, portfolio investment flows. Mm. Uh, we have clearly seen a pickup. So even in the month of uh, May, uh, where goods deficit widened significantly, services exports slowed. Uh, our sense is India still clocked a healthy balance of payment surplus. Um, if we adjust the FX reserve changes uh, for valuation impact, our sense is probably in April and May put together, we were we probably clocked 18 to 20 billion dollars, and that's uh, uh, that is one on the account of portfolio investment pickup. Secondly, if you recall, the governor mentioned uh, that after a few insipid years, um, months, we have started seeing some pickup in FDI also. We do not have the data, but that's another segment which we will have to watch out uh, very yeah. carefully. So capital flows probably better uh, on both FPIs, F FDIs, also the commercial borrowings. This year, the repayment burden is lesser vis-a-vis -vis last year. Okay. So uh, we do have a better buffer on uh, uh, capital uh, uh, account. But again, I mean, CAD will be far better than what it was in the previous year. Our forecast is 1.1. Even if I assume the worst case scenario, it won't be more than 1.5% of GDP, okay. which will be far better than 1.9%, which we saw in fiscal year 23. All right. On that pause, optimistic note, Anubhuti Sahai and Debashesh Mishra, thank you very much for participating in this conversation. Uh, we don't have to... Uh, you know, extrapolate the high trade deficit in May too much is Anubhuti's point. And I think the larger secular point coming from Debashish Mishra is that uh, services exports may be lower because the global banks are not giving too many orders to Indian IT companies, transformational orders. But the non-software exports is a long-term story. So we really needn't worry about current account deficit or balance of payments problems. Far from it. On that positive note, we wrap up uh, with the news that unfortunately the Nifty is still a good 85 points away from its all-time high, but uh, it could still happen today. Let's wait and see. Fingers crossed, Chartbusters up next.